Hello, this is Robert Picardo, the holographic doctor from Star Trek Voyager and Commander Woolsey from Stargate Atlantis. If I only get in Star Wars someday, I will have made the trifecta. And you're listening to Neil Before Pod, because you are smart. Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Here's to the finest crew in Starfleet. Engage. Hello and welcome to Neil Before Pod, the podcast that just can't beat the darkest time. You just can't get rid of it. I'm your host Craig and we are going to be discussing Picard Season 2 for our sins. And to help me with this, for some reason he agreed to be on this thing. Chris, hello. Welcome to Picard Season 2. Hello. Are you ready to discuss Picard Season 2? I don't think I'll ever be ready to discuss Picard Season 2. See how we go here. So... Picard Season 2 is recently finished, and we have both seen it, so let's just go straight into our spoiler-free thoughts. What were your spoiler-free views on this season as a whole? I found this season really, really long. It just seemed that there was lots of unnecessary detours in it overall, really. There were some good moments in there, there were some good nostalgia moments, there were some good character moments peppered through the season, but just overall it just felt way too long and the time travel element of it didn't always particularly work for me okay i didn't like this season very much at all i thought that some individual moments were good as in i would watch a scene and think that was good it was well acted some of it was well written i quite liked what went on there but as a whole i thought it was meandering unfocused laughable at some points i just think it's a bad show and we're back to where we are at the end of season one this is a bad show that occasionally has good moments in it which is really frustrating if this is going to be our final exposure to Jean-Luc Picard as a character because funnily enough this season's a bit about legacy in a way and they are tainting the legacy of the character by continuing with this show yeah that's true but we'll try not to be sweepingly negative. We might have a couple of positive things to say. Who knows? But we won't know until we go into the spoiler section. Do you think Q could send us to the spoiler section? Do you think he has enough strength left? He might do. He might have just enough. Just enough strength. But maybe a little bit left over for a surprise later on. There's maybe. no surprise. I have no surprise. <laughs> There's no surprise left up yet. <laughs> but Q, do your stuff. Un capitan. Oh, I've missed you. There. Okay, now we're in the spoiler timeline. Woohoo, we can talk about whatever we want. Let's start with the man himself, Jean-Luc Picard, or as my brain was calling him, Patrick Picard, because in a lot of ways I don't think this is the same guy that we were watching in The Next Generation, which is fine because he's a bit older, but also it seems that he diverts so much from being that guy that he might as well be a different guy, and I think that's painfully evident in a lot of this season. We'll begin with talking about his childhood trauma, because that's very much the basis of this entire season. Apparently it was the plan all along, according to Q, which I'm really not buying into, but we'll get to that. At some point I'll read you the bullet point list of my interpretation of his plan, the steps in his plan. Remember when Cinema Sins was good and used to do that? It's like, mm-hmm. here's all the things Lex Luthor would have had to do in order to make this event happen the way it did. I did that. So we'll see about that. Okay, so the childhood trauma angle, it took us nine episodes to find out, but Picard is really upset that his mother hung herself when he was a small boy and he had a part to play in it because he let her out of the room that his father locked her into rather than get her to professional help. Seems that locking her in a room is more conducive to healing, I suppose. That is a bit of an unfair comment. The idea is she didn't want help, so they weren't forcing it on her. But when people are a danger to themselves family members sometimes do take the decision out of their hands because they're maybe not mentally fit to make it. Again, they don't really play with that. Maybe they tried that, maybe it didn't work. Who knows? They don't really go into details here. But what did you think of this reveal that Picard has been repressing this for his entire life and apparently it forms the root of who he is as a person? I'm really not wanting to be too down on the show. However, I just didn't buy it as a past story for Picard. There's tons of gaps you've just pointed out there why was there no additional help 
in his time. I was almost expecting part of that to be the reason for the dark timeline rather than, oh no, this is just a part of who Picard was even without the dark timeline. Obviously a traumatic event that would have a serious impact on his well-being, his outlook on life. The way he had changed memories in his head, kind of painted over certain parts of the memories, I found interesting in the way that they had done that in the show where you would see similar events repeated but changed. The playing hide-and-seek and the stories in the conservatory for want of a better word i don't know it was like a greenhouse conservatory hybrid i'm not too sure what the room that they kept going back to was i did find it interesting but i just didn't buy it as the origins of picard the man that we are used to seeing i kind of follow your same logic of this is a similar but different character if you know what i mean i think this is a function of modern writing in a lot of ways where everything needs to have an origin story personality traits need to come from somewhere rather than just being through life experience, through your genes, through the way you're raised, through a number of factors. Instead, it has to be this one profound event in your past that defines who you are forever. And in the case of Picard, he is emotionally closed off because he doesn't remember his mother hanging herself, but he does remember enough to not get close to anybody ever again. But I had accepted that that is just the way Picard is. Throughout the entirety of the time we saw him on Next Generation, he was the captain. He was in a leadership position. Emotional distance was expected because he was potentially ordering people to their death every day. Okay, they weren't dying every day, but any decision he made could have life-ending consequences for people. So he kept himself at that distance. Plus, people need to respect him as the captain. So there's only so outgoing he can be. And... As time went on in Next Generation, he mellowed. He opened up to Wesley in the early seasons as well. You saw that happen. And also, he isn't emotionally closed off to a lot of people. He had a very frank friendship with Dr. Crusher. I know there was this unrequited romance aspect to their relationship, but they were friends. They talked openly to each other. She wasn't really in the chain of command because she was the doctor, so she didn't have to be bound by his orders in the same way. And they were old friends. And then whenever an admiral that he was friendly with or another captain turned up, they would be really chatty. So he did have those more open connections. It's just that you didn't really see them among the crew. And that was reminded of this particular moment in Next Generation that gives you a great indication of who Picard is as a leader, as a person and so on. He is sitting at his desk. He's playing Angry Birds on his iPad or something like that. He's got his feet on the desk and then the door goes and he takes his feet off the desk. He says, come. And then Riker walks in. So he goes immediately into professional mode. I can't let a subordinate see me with my feet up the desk all relaxed like this. That's it. It's professional distance. So the idea that his good nature and desire to help people and desire to be a captain and all that stuff comes from the fact that he suffered this loss as a child. I'm just not buying it. It's just not feasible as far as I'm concerned. The exploration of Picard's inner psyche was interesting and... The idea that he misjudged his father throughout all these years. He saw him as an abusive figure or remembered him as an abusive figure where that wasn't quite correct was an interesting reveal, I guess. The idea that with an adult perspective, childhood looks different, but it wasn't a necessary reveal because going back to Picard's childhood isn't something that you ever really needed to think about. At least not something I needed to think about. You could have done something else with the character this season because the whole purpose of this plot is to make sure he gets over that trauma and is able to move on. Q does this effectively so that he can get a girlfriend (laughs) in the last episode. That's why all this is done. Looking at it at a really shallow high level, this is why it's done. Because it's introduced as a concept when Laris makes it clear that she's interested in him and he recoils. And then at the end of the season, he tells Laris, no, I'm I'm fine now. We can be together. And then that's the way. So that's all Q wanted, apparently. Picard to sort himself out so he could engage in a, ro- engage in a romantic relationship, which is a really simplistic look at it. But ultimately, that's what he was doing, which is really weird. I agree with you with that. My impression of his distance was similar to yours. It was he's in a leadership position. He's in charge of all the people on the ship. So... 
he has that isolation where he's at everyone else's boss. He's not allowed to fraternize with the Lord X and in inverted commas. And they had a similar set of lines on Voyager as well with Janeway. Normally, for me to chat, relax, and be okay with someone, it would be someone that is my rank or superior. Or when you get shore leave, when you're off ship. And you got that with Picard as well, where you get the mandated leave to go to Riza or whatnot, and you get that where he's told, no, you must go off and relax and deal with your trauma and off he would go to Riza and he'd be able to chat away with someone absolutely fine. The distance aspect would be because he's on the crew. The chain of command element is there and he can't get too close to people because it affects judgment and it affects decision making. You know, your friend would be the best person to go on this away mission. However, the away mission has risks. So do you go, well, they're my friend, so I'm not going to send them on this away mission, even though it would make sense. I always took it as that element with Picard. It was a professionalism and potentially sometimes adhering too closely to that and not letting people through that firewall rather than a emotional firewall. I don't know if I'm explaining that too right, but that was my impression, was that it was a level of professionalism rather than always an emotional wall. Yeah, and people are just like that as well. Some people just find it more difficult to trust people, let people in. It doesn't mean that anything massive happened to you as a child. It's just experience has taught you to be that way. Especially, again, with Picard, he's dealt with a lot of different people over the course of his career. He's met a lot of duplicitous aliens. He's done a lot. His life has been full and his life experiences have been extensive. So just boiling it down to this one event does him a disservice, I think. And it's the fact that it comes from nowhere. In fact, they have to throw in a hand wavy line to explain how he managed to see his mother as an old woman in that season one episode of The Next Generation. When he says... I used to imagine her as an old woman or something like that. And apparently the internet was lighting up with, wow, this gives this episode or this scene in this episode much more meaning than it did before. I'm thinking, does it? Because it's a season one episode. It's not a good episode. It's just he talks to his mother in that scene and she offers him a cup of tea. And that's what he says in that is it seems like you're going a long way around to not destroying canon in that way but also it wasn't his real mother anyway it was just a manifestation so whatever i didn't feel like i needed that and the abusive father angle we always knew he had a difficult relationship with his father that was apparent throughout and you see that reflected in the way his relationship with his brother is they have a discussion about that in that family episode an excellent family episode. Apparently his brother is mentioned this season, which is something I missed, but someone pointed out to me. It's mentioned in the flashbacks in the first episode that his brother is off at boarding school, but he's not mentioned after that. That was going to be one of my questions, because I was sitting thinking, where is the brother in this? The thing is, that first mention of the brother being at boarding school, though, doesn't it make sense that the brother would come back to support the family during a difficult time? Or is it just that they just kept him away? Not in the Picard family. It's no, a stiff not, upper not lip. in the Picard family. It's stiff upper lip. We've locked your mother in a room and we've sent your brother off to boarding school. Anyway, you'll be able to deal with it by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't seem too right. But yeah, okay, if they've covered it with maybe one line of dialogue in there. But it seemed that they did that a lot this season overall, though is every time they came across a thing that was going to breach canon, they would sort of do that, oh, we need a throwaway line quick that just explains everything. There we go. That'll do. <laughs> Did anyone notice this is set in the same year that that Deep Space Nine time travel episode takes place? No? Okay. Quick, someone write Sanctuary District on a sign and put it up in the background. That'll fix it. <laughs> <laughs> done. <laughs> someone put the name Brunner in a newspaper so the nerds will find it. Job done. Cool. Canon is preserved. <laughs> Not that I think they should be so slavish to canon, but I actually thought the year 2024 was deliberate for that reason, because it was such a pivotal year in Star Trek history. Apparently not. Apparently they just picked it because it's a couple of years away from when the show was made. And it was easy to disguise our own time period as one, two years from now, or three years from when they were making it, I suppose. You don't need to do too much to gloss it up to make it futuristic, I guess. But still, technology has had a significant leap over ours. In some ways, yes. In some ways. They don't have those weird computers that they had in past tense, those Deep Space Nine episodes, those weird ones that you used styluses to operate and <laughs> you had to have some kind of credentials to get on the internet or just the net, as it was known in those episodes. <laughs> Imagine if people needed credentials to get on the internet. That would be pretty good, actually. Imagine all the grief you would avoid. It would avoid trolling on the internet and stuff like that, wouldn't it? 
to some degree, yeah. Maybe Elon Musk's Twitter will be like that. You'll need some form of credentials <laughs> to get. Let's not get political. <laughs> Even though this season got very political. The thing about Picard as a character is you have something right there that you can use if you want to explore some kind of unresolved trauma. Remember in Generations when they revealed that his brother and nephew and his sister-in-law had been killed in a fire? Mm. And it's not something the film addresses too much other than Picard really upset about it. And it informs his Nexus fantasy where he's lamenting the fact that he never had a family. But it's never really been covered since then. So why not do that? Why not use that as a trauma? Why not play with the fact that he wasn't there or that he could have been there and decided not to go that week or something like that. They could have done something with that and really played with the brother and nephew relationship because in many ways, Rene, another Rene, funnily enough, is the son that he never had. And his nephew was a lot more like him than he was like his brother. So that could have been a really interesting angle to play with, to do it that way, rather than let's invent this tragic backstory from way back why not do a more recent one and address the fact that maybe he never got closure on that? I don't know. Give that a go. That'll be next season. It would have potentially made more sense. Yeah, because all that happened and did he deal with it? I don't really think he did. He didn't visibly deal with it. Well, suppose at the end of Generations, he gets the lesson that you should cherish every moment because they never come again, which I guess can connect to that. It's just a mess. I didn't like this backstory element at all. Although I did like the brain trip episode where Dr. Baltar was his father slash therapist that had some interesting, again, moments in it, that had some good scenes in it. It was good to see James Callis playing opposite him and then you had the meta aspect to the fact that he's playing a manifestation inside Picard's head. Picard himself is a humanoid android creature. You can make all those weird Battlestar connections just by yes. the fact that he's there. It's always good seeing James Callis turn up and stuff. A little bit of me was like, oh, you've used him for this now, which means you can't pull him into other shows or use him somewhere else in Star Trek. I was kind of like, oh, that's a bit of a shame. But I did think he was very good. I liked this little mini plot twist when they had him as the therapist and then it turns out it's his dad. Yeah, because he doesn't remember what his dad looks like, apparently. Yeah, it's sort of a twist for us, but it shouldn't be for Picard, but... I guess that was maybe part of the... Well, it was a brain injury at that point, wasn't it? As his robot brain reboots itself. I kind of enjoyed the way that twist played out. The thing is that that episode overall, because of the amount of time that was spent on all that sort of things, it felt like another pause episode. There were lots of episodes that were pauses in plot and it was like this is a delay in order to make sure that we have another three episodes to do another four episodes to do and that kind of had a little bit of an element of that to me because everything else took a back seat for that episode pretty much but there were some interesting elements to it yeah i kept having that feeling throughout every new episode it was they're still in the past they're still in the past why are they still in the past <laughs> it's a season-long story that they could have wrapped up in a couple of episodes quite easily. Because there's a lot of, as I said, meandering to it. And I suppose it's a good time to talk about Q and his connection to Picard mm. in this season. So he comes to Picard after he ends up in the evil Star Trek timeline. He comes to him at the Chateau and he's angry. Q is angry because he blames Picard for something. And the implication is he blames him for causing this timeline somehow. The implication is he allows him to keep his memories and conveniently the rest of the cast to keep their memories, in order to fix it. But then later on it reveals that Q was the one that broke the timeline for some reason. Again, I'll read out the bullet points later, but it doesn't make any sense. So this first episode, and I feel like this first episode that Q appears in was written without thinking about where the rest of the season was going because they wanted the conversation to play out in a certain way. It's, here's another test for you, Picard. This is all your fault. Sort it out. And it plays out, but ultimately it's the same lesson that Picard learns in Tapestry, which is... For those that don't know, the episode where he's dying and Q gives him the opportunity to undo some mistakes in his past. But by undoing that mistake, he ends up living an unfulfilling life where he doesn't go anywhere because he doesn't lean into his ambition. He doesn't speak up. He doesn't get noticed. So the lesson there is that horrible thing where he ended up with a artificial heart was a necessary experience because it gave him the confidence to stand up for himself, get noticed throughout his career. It got him to where he wanted to be in his career, or it encouraged a pattern of behaviour that helped him rise through the ranks and so forth and become a confident and self-assured person and 
However, the lesson there is you have to take the bad with the good. Sometimes a bad experience is there for a good reason and it can be more informative than you might think, which is exactly the same lesson he learns at the end of this season. He puts the skeleton key in the wall, learns my mother has to hang herself so that I become the man I am today. You already learned that. Q already taught you this lesson and it only took 45 minutes. This took eight episodes, seven episodes, whatever. Why are we repeating this stuff and why are we taking so long to do it? Yeah, it's that thing. Your experiences form your later years, so if you change that, then your path changes. I agree with you that initial appearance of Q is, again, misdirect for the audience to be like, oh, Q's up to mischief and up to this and changing the timeline and putting all this in place. Because you spend a lot of time going, what's Q doing this for or why is he doing it in this particular way it's just sort of unsatisfying as a viewer to be like oh right so you weren't really thinking about what was happening later on i suppose the excuse is that q is also trying to misdirect picard rather than saying this is a a lesson and a way for you to redeem yourself it's like oh if i told you that's what was going to happen then you wouldn't have done it sort of thing i don't know <laughs> it just doesn't make sense it's a good point for me to just read q's plan so i bullet point you that there are six bullet points of important events that i considered i say important events they're not important but the events that seem to lead into q's point so first bullet point q approaches picard in the totalitarian timeline holding him in contempt for being responsible for it while enabling him to prevent it Then Q goes back in time to prevent Rene Picard taking her place in history in order to create the totalitarian timeline, something he has supposedly already done. So did he need to be a part of the events twice? Why? After that, he discovers that he has no powers, so sets about manipulating events in different ways, such as tasking Soong to be an obstacle for Picard by promising to cure the genetic sickness his daughter suffers from, which then results in Soon running Picard over at this party, which causes him to become trapped within himself and forcing him to work through his trauma to come out of his coma. And then after internalising that lesson, Picard hides the skeleton key in the place he will find it as a young boy so that his mother can hang herself. Then Q approaches Picard to tell him that doing that was the point of all of this. It's a really elaborate scenario just to get soon to run him over. Could he not have just paid someone? Here's a hundred bucks, go run that guy over. Yeah. It seems a lot easier because soon doesn't really do much else. There was a lot of that this season, though, where it was like, oh, we need an excuse to bring these actors back in because we like working with these actors rather than this character needs to be this way or uh, this character needs to be the one. To make it a soon character was like, oh, because we want Brent Spiner back in the show. Thanks. That's why we're doing it this way. That element didn't make as much sense to me very same with having laris and talon looking the same it's so that we can have the same actors and people in it we're not rocking the boat by doing all this similar again to soji and and cory being the same it was because we liked working with these actors last season and we want to continue to work with them this season we want them to be season regulars we don't want them to be guest stars for two episodes or whatnot and exactly like you say hugh okay he, he wasn't able to uses powers in the same way but he still had all his knowledge and was able to use that knowledge of the timeline and events to acquire money to be able to do stuff he was able to manipulate technology because he still has all his knowledge so yeah he definitely could have worked out a way to cause issues to picard without uh, engaging soon whatsoever just doesn't quite make sense for the plan timeline wise between him appearing in the dark timeline and his manipulation of events to create the dark timeline i've obviously got to promote our time travel podcast um, which we are yet to record yes can't go this entire episode without mentioning that because it's now a running thing we need to do an update of that now (laughs) it does need to be updated but this is one of those ones where you sit and go right how how does this work because q can be any place anytime we don't know at what point in Q's timeline we are seeing him throughout Star Trek, really. Well, his appearances have always been pretty linear. This one is also linear. Yeah. My bet would be that he can't be in the dark timeline before he's created it, if you know what I mean. So that must be out of sequence in my head. I can't remember the exact words, but he said something along the lines of this was his fault, this was Picard's fault, and I don't understand why that is 
but it's clear that he was the one that created it. So when you catch up with Q during the events of the rest of the season, it should be him flitting about before he has that conversation with Picard in the Chateau. Because otherwise, like I said, has he done it twice? Yeah. Did he go back twice? Why is he back there again? And why is he trying to stop the Europa mission? He doesn't want the dark timeline. That much is clear. He doesn't want it. So why is he putting the timeline at risk just to teach Picard a lesson? It's got to be an easier way to do it. Just drag him into some white space and show him his past. Easy enough. But yeah, you had, obviously, the actors playing their ancestors soon. Brent Spiner always does that. Corey plays sort of Soji's ancestor, but not really because Soji's an android. So Soji is just has the same face. Talon is Laris's ancestor when they reveal that she's Romulan using the weird hollow face stuff. Yeah, I just hide my ears. Here I am, Romulan, no problem. Still with an Irish accent because Romulus has Ireland as well. There's an Ireland on Romulus. Some people talk like that. Fine, don't mind. Every planet has an emerald isle. <laughs> yeah. I was actually half expecting, or when I thought about it later, I'm surprised that they didn't use the same actress as Picard's mother for Renee mm. because of the ancestral thing. And that's where you can get James Callis turning up. He just can play legions of Picard ancestors because that's the way it works. There's almost a Wizard of Oz quality to it as well, if you think about it, because mm. he's encountering all these ancestors that look like people he knows. So it could have all been a weird fever dream and he wakes up and he's like, I had the weirdest dream. You were there and you were there and you were there. I would actually like to see Patrick Stewart say that. <laughs> would that be worse than the finale we got if he woke up and he went, it was all a dream and he was still in the shadow? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I dozed off and all this happened. Yeah, I dozed off. The classic TV one where he wakes up in the shower. Yeah. <laughs> that could be an element of it, I guess. They're all doing the ancestral thing in there, but it's there a lot. To me, it just seems like, yeah, okay, I, I get it. It can happen with genetics, I guess. But it just seems to me like, oh yeah, because we want these actors and we want to do the same people that we used before. Here we go, done. Some really shallow gene pools in the Star Trek universe. Yeah, exactly. Especially the Soong family. That's why he has to engineer his children and build androids and stuff because those genes are useless. <laughs> yeah, you can kind of get away with Corey because the other ones are androids, so it's based off of pictures or a template or family photos or whatever. It's like, okay, yeah, you can... Yeah, But why know, would Data can... know it? Why would Data yeah. have that face in his brain? <laughs> Why would that be stored there? Why would that, I don't know. Multiple songs have kind of done that already through the show, I guess. It just seems to lay it on extra. Well, this is the fourth song that has played, because he played Noonien Soong, the creator of Data and mm. Lore. He played Arik Soong in Enterprise. He played Alton Inigo Soong last season. And now Adam Soong in this one. <laughs> Yeah. And then the Laris and Talon cover just seemed to be so that they could continue Picard's romance through the season. Whereas if it had been another woman, they wouldn't have been able to continue the romance narrative through. Yeah. That was still there. He still had feelings for her because she looked the same. It wasn't the same person. It was an ancestor, but he still was treating her the same. Or that was the impression that I got for a lot of it. It only came up a couple of times, though. There was points where he would look at her longingly and she'd pick up on it. Mm. Like when she asked him, who is Laris to you? And he says, no one of importance. And she says, right, now I know what it looks like when you lie. And I think that's the only example of it. Mm. I can really think of. But she ended up becoming his emotional anchor in some ways, despite the fact that they've only known each other for a couple of days. And her presence in his mind in the mind trip episode wasn't really pivotal. If she hadn't been there, it wouldn't have made a difference. It's not that she helps him internalize something. He was already doing that himself. So her being there, she looks after his inner child, I guess, a little bit. But if you'd cut her, you wouldn't have missed it. And with a few tweaks, Talon could have just been gaining the character yeah. didn't need to really be there. Potentially. The only bit in that episode in the catacombs in his mind underneath the chateau, it was when she interacted with young Picard that he clicked, I think in the next scene where they cut over to the therapist's room, it was that scene where he then clicks on what's happening. And it was almost like he needed that nudge when she went in to do the, oh, this isn't right. 
and then at that point he started to process it more because after that they get reunited in the chateau a few scenes after that yeah so that seemed like she awoke that side but yeah she wasn't pivotal then to any of the revelations it was just that initial nudge that seemed to do it he could have got there on his own you wouldn't yeah. have had to change it at all really in yeah. order for him to get there would it have made more sense if it had been Gainan? probably actually if you think about their connection and so on the talon character was all right i quite liked her being a distant mother figure to renee actually the fact that she'd watched over this person for such a long time she had that connection with her but it was a one-way connection in a way it's a bit like if someone gives a child up for adoption for whatever reason but keeps an eye on them throughout the years mm. I don't know if that's a thing that has ever happened in fiction that I've seen. I imagine it must happen in real life. I check in on you from time to time, look you up, but I can't approach you because it's too dangerous to be near me or I don't think you should be near me or whatever. But you had that and the fact that they actually had closure on that. It was a really simple and really elegantly done character arc, actually. I've never spoken to Renee. She then speaks to Renee, gets some closure in that relationship and then dies, which is really simple but works pretty well. I think it's one of the few things that actually followed through naturally and they didn't spend any more time on it than it needed to be spent on it. And the reality is it didn't really need to be there. But I thought it was a nice moment when they did it, even though there's a bit of logic leap around. But you've always sensed I was there. I was always a little bit careless. So you'd see me out the corner of your eye. Yeah, whatever. I don't believe in that. But it was nice enough as a moment. I thought it was a very touching scene. It was the fact that Renee was standing there going, who's this strange person that's just walked into this room? Like, I know that you're not supposed to be here. And then... The fact that slowly she realises, oh, you were at that event, or you gave me this necklace, or you talked to me at that event, and she slowly starts to click. I've maybe only seen you once every 10 years or once every 8 years of my life, but I now place you again. I now realise where I've seen you before. And it did give closure to that circle of i've never been able to talk to her i've never been able to go right up to her. the whole idea is that she never knows that i was ever here totally transparent just helping behind to make sure that anything that needs nudged gets nudged i thought that was a neat part of the arc this season i thought that element was done well could it be slightly tidier i don't know but that element worked for me definitely in the final episode i found that more of an emotional beat than the final chat with q well, the final chat with Q I'll get back to in a second because I derailed myself from that. This is something that seemed to happen a lot in this season was characters hanging around for longer than they needed to. So Renee was probably in a couple of episodes too many. As in, once they got her into quarantine, that's it. She's not needed anymore. She just turns up for the finale and she's still feeling a bit apprehensive about it. And you have this whole mental health angle that I don't think they go too deeply into, even though it actually connects to what Picard is experiencing. He does have that one conversation with her, which is really good, where he is the one that tells her the fact that you're afraid means that you're intelligent. Don't be afraid of your own fear, but listen to it, that kind of thing. So I like that conversation that they had and the mental health angle, the fact that she was crippled by depression and so on. I don't know an awful lot about psychological evaluations when it comes to going on to space missions, but... If she was that damaged, would they be letting her go into space? I don't think so. Based on modern sensibilities of space travel, do you not have to have some kind of mental stability in order to do it, rather than sitting there having doubts about it a couple of days before the mission, discussing it with a therapist? Fair enough, she doesn't declare it, or maybe she does, I don't know. But some kind of psychological evaluation is involved before you get put into space, surely? No, oh, definitely. There's a lot of training that goes into even current space flight for going up to things like the iss it's confined space with others yeah we have to make sure this person doesn't freak out and crash into something yeah exactly can they cope being separated from others for a long period of time are they able to be in enclosed spaces for a long period of time with just like three or four other people if crews don't gel then it can cause severe problems especially on something like a mars mission because it's a long time to get there it's a long time to get back and you're spending a long time on the planet when you do yeah and this was Europa, which is even further away than Yeah, this. yeah, exactly. This is the Europa mission. You're hopping further along. And even in the current climate, the researching things like that, there's a NASA site in, I'm going to say it's Hawaii, but I might be wrong. And it's in the edge of a, a volcano. And they've basically been putting people in there for months at a time to research how different people can get along in an enclosed environment. They're not allowed to go outside of the bubble without wearing a spacesuit. 
for example, despite the fact that they're on Earth. So it's all to sort of simulate what the actual effects would be if you were on a planet rather than Earth. It's very interesting. In fact, there was a podcast about it that I cannot remember the name of, but it was a really interesting documentary into what actually happened when they tried that experiment. Perhaps you can find it for the show notes. I will find it for the show notes just for you. So yes, some kind of psychological evaluation would have been done. They would have determined Renee is not stable here. She's really struggling with something. We probably can't trust her behind the controls of a spaceship. We'll find someone else. So that bit I didn't understand. The fact that it was all hinging on convincing her to go into quarantine because as soon as she goes into quarantine, there's no turning back. Which there obviously is because she was thinking about backing out even when she immediately came out of quarantine. But it was the night before she was going into quarantine, she was thinking, I can't do this. I'm going to tell the mission commander right here at this party that I can't do this. So you would think that the psychological evaluations would have been done long before this and they'd be monitoring her because she was freaking out in the simulator. So I don't understand how this problem comes about, how it gets to that stage. I do understand why it gets to the stage on a narrative level. It's about the fact that Renee has to push aside her emotional problems in order to achieve her destiny, the same way that Picard has to do that. So there's a connection there. But from a reality point of view, it just seems like spaceflight has far more checks and balances involved that she would never get there to that point if she was suffering that much. Because she's a danger to other people if she has an episode at the wrong moment. The thing is, she's not exactly hiding it either. At the gala event and at other things in the run-up, she's not exactly hiding her current feelings. So it would be found out. It wasn't that she was keeping a low profile on it and it was all a secret. If she was visiting a psychiatrist, that's on the record. It doesn't seem likely, and I'm with you on that. The podcast that was trying to remember the name of, by the way, was called The Habitat. So the link for that will be in the show notes. Nice one. Fine, okay. We have to push aside the reality of the fact that she would never get anywhere near that mission with her emotional problems being at the heights they were. But they convince her to get in. That's her done. You don't need her anymore. And then she turns up in the finale for some reason, just because we need to inject some false jeopardy. And we'll have some drones. And we'll have Soong, who infects her with a fast-acting neurotoxin that's on a sticker on his hand that he then removes with his ungloved hand. (laughs) <laughs> after infecting <laughs> which just made me laugh this fast acting neurotoxin it's going to kill you in like a minute uh oh I've just touched it it's like in the unbearable weight of massive talent the Nicolas Cage movie that we recently saw yes <laughs> it's a similar idea was it a sedative or something like that don't touch your skin he's like uh oh <laughs> and he does and he almost passes out or he does pass out spoilers for the unbearable weight of massive talent it just made me laugh when that happened okay did he transfer all of it is that all gone? Can you be sure of that? I think it'd be funny if Soong just fell over dead at that point. And he killed Talon anyway. The head canon, I'll say, he's already given himself an antidote or an anti venom equivalent. <laughs> Chrissy's head cannon getting round it there, but yes, I totally see that. And the thing is, if he has access to this stuff all the time, why was there such a clunky plan for the gala at the beginning where they were going to try and get her? You already had the opportunity to use this. Yeah, I guess they had to get her in. To, I don't know, actually. Because the whole point was stopping her, right? So if she died at the gala, that would have solved the problem. Yeah, it was just stop her getting on the thing. It wasn't casually convince her not to go. Q's option was really force her to decide not to go herself. Meanwhile, Soong's one was more, Bridge is going to kill her. In which case, she could have done that back at the gala. Yeah, and go around and just touch Picard and his mates as well. Yeah, exactly. Solves that problem. But again, why does Q want to prevent Rene going on the mission? Apart from to spur Picard into internalising his own trauma. But those two events aren't connected. Picard resolving that has no bearing on whether the Europa mission succeeds. If he had learned an emotional lesson and then used that to convince Rene to join the mission after all, that would have created some kind of connection. But the two things are happening independently of each other. So it's just, we're going to throw this in, we're going to throw this in, and we'll leave the audience to figure out why, and we can't figure out why, because there's zero logic to any of it. Yeah. Getting back to Q then, you said that you found his final scene unsatisfying, and I would agree there. Again, it's one of those things where you sit two great actors in a room, and you let them interact, and the dialogue itself is well written enough, so... When you put two actors like that in a room, when they have that history together as well, you're going to get fireworks. You're going to get really good results out of it because Mm. they're great. And capitalising on Q's affection for Picard and 
the fact that he always really rooted for him and really wanted him to do well and so on was a nice touch because that is consistent with the relationship. Even gods have favourites, Jean Luc. You were always one of mine. Really liked it. I wonder if he was doing a bit of a victory tour or death tour, I suppose. Dropped in on Janeway. <laughs> she wasn't having it. She just kicked him out. Drops in on Mariner and Lord X for a bit because remember that? Remember <laughs> his appearance there? Was that a test of some sort? <laughs> So his whole reasoning for everything, according to this conversation, is he's dying alone and he doesn't want that for Picard. So he engineers this whole thing to make sure that Picard doesn't die alone. Again, so that Picard wakes up to the wanting a girlfriend, essentially. Which is oversimplifying it a bit, but not by much, actually. My issues with the conversation is that Picard doesn't question what Q says in any way. If you look back at any interaction they've had in The Next Generation... Even when Picard understands the lesson, he will question the way it was delivered. If you look back at Q Who, that incident results in 18 members of the Enterprise crew being killed by the Borg, being scooped up and taken by the Borg. And he says, I understand the lesson, but it could have been done without the loss of 18 members of my crew. Really good there. Tapestry, he understands the lesson. He holds Q in contempt for the way he delivered it, and so on. And all good things, he's impatient about it. So Picard should have said to Q, why the hell did we have to go through all this? Why did you do this? Well, he does question the deaths. And Q says, well, at least in this timeline, Talon got to speak to Renee. She dies in all of them, but in this one, she got closure on that relationship. Isn't that good? What about Eleanor's death? Well, technically, Seven's crazy husband killed him. Okay. What about Gerati, who has been forever changed by the Borg? Oh, whatever. Just one of those things, isn't it? But at least Picard's not upset about his mother anymore. So that justifies all this death. (laughs) It just doesn't make sense that Picard would stand there and be like, thanks Q, I really needed this. This was the right thing to do here. And when Q's about to do that final snap, he's about to wink himself out of existence and return them to the present day. Picard hugs him as if to say to him, you're not alone, you're not going to die alone. Here's some affection right back at you. It does a disservice to the Picard character. I feel like it's a betrayal of the Picard character, a betrayal of that relationship. And I suppose the only person in character there is Q. Because he feels like he can manipulate universal events in any way he sees fit. Because he's Q, he's a god, he doesn't think in the same way. I did like it when Rios said something like, time is a funny thing, and Q responds with, yeah, it is. <laughs> As if he'd never thought about it that way before. But I really like that, that little realisation that he almost had. Never thought about that. Like, yeah, it is. it's kind of a funny thing. And then added to that is when Picard says to Q, is there some event where I'll be required? And Q says, why does it always have to be about universal stakes and whatever else he says? And then there is an event that Picard is required at because they go back to the present day and there's a weird anomaly that they don't explain that's about to destroy the quadrant. And also the evil timeline is a universal stake because failure means that they break the timeline. So there are two universal stakes (laughs) that involved Picard in this season. After Q says, why does it have to be about universal stakes? But it has been this whole time. Yes, and it's about to be again in the next scene after this. I agree with you. You get really good actors in there and you throw the emotions about and it works to an extent. I think it was well acted. You get the past relationship with these characters we've seen it develop over seasons of tv but i totally agree with you with the fact that picard doesn't question enough the why all this why manipulate the timeline in order to teach this lesson before q has snapped his fingers and put him into a simulation of sherwood forest or done bits like that rather than actually manipulating time in order to teach the lesson the stakes for picard and his crew would still be real in that timeline or in that simulation that's been done in the past that's what kind of threw me with this you've put all of this at risk because it was a big gamble by q that picard's crew and picard himself would be able to resolve this issue you didn't get the hint that oh if this all went wrong by the way and you didn't get to this point where you had managed to solve the timeline problem that i was going to fix it anyway it wasn't that oh don't worry i always had a safety net which was me clicking my fingers and making sure that that bad timeline didn't happen again this problem that i created by the way for reasons yeah. that still aren't explained that i created so the Jurati borg hybrid that was there at the beginning of the show 
before I clicked my fingers and created it anyway. It was already there. The Rios thing, that had already happened. So Cube was always going to, I don't know, I get confused with these things. <laughs> I'll, I'll end up in a logic loop and I'll never get out of it again. The whole time travel element was supposed to be a predestination situation. That's why the Gerati Queen is there already. Yes. And Guinan confirms that in the final episode where she says, I've had a picture of Rios up in the bar this whole time that you've never noticed. And we need to go back to the first episode and see if it is there. See if we can catch it in the background <laughs> in any way. So Guinan has known this this whole time, and this has all been a predestination thing. I'm okay with that in a way, because time travel in Star Trek has never been consistent. Yes. But also, it's not even consistent within this season, because when Picard meets young Guinan, played by a different actor, which is in itself inconsistent, because the last time he met a younger Guinan when he travelled through time, at an earlier point in her life, she looked like Whoopi Goldberg. I do wonder if that line in the first episode about Elorians can choose to age was supposed to accommodate that, so she chose to look younger at some point in her life. I don't know if the choosing to age works in both directions. Maybe it does. I don't know. They don't explain it, but they have that. And then Guinan doesn't recognise Picard because, as the showrunner said in an interview that's not brought up in any of the episodes, the timeline's been changed, so Time's Arrow didn't happen, which is inconsistent with what they say at the end of the season because it's supposed to be a predestination thing. It's as if the writers of the show haven't seen Time's Arrow, which I would believe. And it was just a quick explanation the showrunner came up with when asked about it. Oh, crap, I've not seen that episode. Eh, timeline change. Didn't happen. <laughs> so if that didn't happen, then how does Punk on Bus remember to turn his music down when he's asked to, rather than just being obstinate? <laughs> Yeah. On a slight diversion, because we're talking about Guinan, I also had to question, when they first go to the bar in the future, the bar is bar 10. On Forward Avenue. On Forward Avenue. Oh, cool. She found somewhere called Forward Avenue and opened a bar called 10 Forward, because it used to be Deck 10 Forward section, right? Okay, cool. That's cool. And then they go back into the past. <laughs> she still has a bar called 10 on Forward Street, and you go... Well, that's convenient. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, is that just her rule of where she will operate a bar? I will only operate it if the numbers 10 and the forward direction are mentioned. Otherwise, it's not happening. The Enterprise Mess Hall is on deck 10 at the front section, so I'm going to work there and I'm going to call it 10 forward. Yes, that's some weird shenanigans afoot there, but anyway. Yeah, that annoyed me too because 10 forward isn't called 10 forward because anyone named it that way. It's because it is on deck 10 at the front of the ship. And that's why it's called that. There's no other reason. So yes, Guinan having a bar called 10 Forward in the 21st century is stupid. Yeah, it made sense after the Enterprise. It didn't make sense before the Enterprise. It should have been somewhere else in that first bit, and then they could have had the bar getting destroyed or something when the raid happened, and it would have explained why she moved, and then you'd be like, oh, that's fine. Yeah, or just called something else, perhaps. Or called something else. Yeah, exactly. Might as well talk about Guinan, since we're on that subject. So she appears throughout the season as the younger Guinan. I really liked the younger actress playing Guinan. I thought she channeled Whoopi Goldberg really well while also putting her own spin on it. Really great stuff with her. And seeing Whoopi Goldberg back in the role a couple of times was good as well. She sets up Picard's arc for the season in a way by saying, this journey that you need to take is within you rather than external to you and all that vague stuff. I've got a picture of Rios on the wall that I'm covering up here by standing in front of it so you don't see it. <laughs> Just in case you question it. What about that? Oh, that's Rios's ancestor. I used to know him. Don't worry, you're going to meet a lot of ancestors that look like their descendants. So it's not an outlandish explanation anymore. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Seeing Whoopi Goldberg back in the role was good. And I'm surprised they just didn't use her in the past. I guess it's the fact that she's getting on in years and it was filmed during a pandemic and her availability is probably pretty slight. Patrick Stewart went on her chat show and asked her to be in the next season and she said yes on air. Maybe she felt a bit cajoled <laughs> on the spot. Well, if I say no, then I'm going to lose the Star Trek audience. It's one of those things that made sense as a character appearance because it's someone that he knows already in that time. So it was a totally an appearance that made sense. I'm the same as you. It was nice seeing Whoopi Goldberg back in the role. I thought Young Guinan was really, really good. It was nice seeing that kick-ass version of her. Not as toned down, not as elegant, for want of a better description. This is Guinan running a dive bar. Yeah, although she was always a bit rough and ready in Next Generation. Yeah. It would come up every now and again. Remember one episode where she went to play some phaser game with Worf, like target practice, 
And Worf's like, I play at level 10. And she says, I suppose I could come down to that level. <laughs> Stuff like that. And I think there's another one where she diffuses a tense moment in 10 forward with a big phaser rifle that she keeps under the bar. Things like that. Yeah, Guinan's been around. And the younger Guinan, she's quite muscular as well. She's got a pretty big arm. Mm. So maybe Guinan under those flowing robes is packing some serious guns. You can imagine that would be the case. Under that hat, she'll rip you to pieces. <laughs> you can see that happening. <laughs> But yeah, her as a, not a foil for Picard, but as a honest ear that you can turn to, that's always been what she is to him. She has that unique relationship with them. It's undefined, really. You don't know why it's so close. You just know that it is. But you know when Picard goes to speak to her, he will get what he needs from that conversation. And any character that goes to speak to Guinan will get that. You go down at 10 forwards, you'll fix your life in a single conversation. That's what will happen. That's the way Guinan operates. That's why I kind of liked the alternate take when he goes in and she's ready to give up and leave. She's done with humanity. That's enough. I liked that twist because, like you say, normally we're used to someone else going to 10 forward and getting a bit of advice and a drink, where in this case it was Picard going and actually giving advice. He was expecting to try and get some advice, that's what he wanted, and instead what he got was, oh, I've got to try and solve this this time. Yeah, although they could have still done that by acknowledging the fact that they'd met before in Time's Arrow. Mm. Imagine Picard had turned up to 10 forward, the bar. <laughs> Not the room in the forward Enterprise. Street, yes. <laughs> yeah. He turns up there, Guinan comes out and says, you again. You could still have her losing hope because she could say, I no longer believe in this positive future that you came from last time we met. And Picard could say, you've kind of got a point. I actually came from a future that's pretty bad. So yeah, I can see what direction we're going in here, but we have to stop it. And he's the one that gives Gain and hope once again, lets her believe in a better future allows her to stick around. I believe that part of it. And it's one of the things that the pacing in the season struggled with because in the episode where Guinan first appears and talks to Picard, the plot just completely stops so that they can deliver some social commentary. And it's relevant social commentary where Guinan says, there's a handful of people in the world that have enough money to fix every problem that exists, but they don't do it, etc., etc. She makes all those points about black people are treated like second-class citizens. It's easy when they look like Picard, although... He's an old man, so people don't really listen to him either, I suppose, even if he is an old white man, unless he's rich, which he's not, because he's a time traveller with no money. Never address the money issue in this season, actually, funnily enough. They never seem to need to get money. No one has to sell anything, like they do in the Voyage Home. It's the one <laughs> thing they don't steal from the Voyage Home. Seven and Raffi get on a bus, no problem, without establishing where they got their money. Oh, no. No, they do, because Raffi beats up a guy and steals his wallet. There you go. Theft. Yeah, That's <laughs> yeah there we go. That's there was no selling. It. Theft. <laughs> well, that's how they two did it. No one else, really. Maybe there's just enough money to go around. I don't know. They don't really spend much time getting buses after that point. It doesn't matter. But again, in having lost hope, Picard giving her that hope again. You could have still done that with their prior relationship, the meeting in Time's Arrow. And then you even still get to that same end point where Guinan says, I really can't wait to meet you again, mm. rather than holding him in contempt. This bald guy promised me the future would be better, but it's rubbish. And then Picard's comment about change always comes later than it should and all that stuff. That was all really good stuff. But again, stops the plot dead in its tracks so they can explain it. Yeah, there was a few bits of social commentary scattered throughout the season. Star Trek does that a lot. But because it was such a close... I mean, it's still set in the future, but it's such a close future to ours. There was a lot of it laid in in the season. Yeah, and some of it relevant, some of it interesting. The stuff around Rios, mm -hmm. on the verge of being disappeared, because that's what happens to people that look like him, people that have his nationality. That was okay, and I like the contrast between, say, Rafi encountering someone that tries to mug her. So she's experienced some of the worst of humanity, in effect. And in that same episode, maybe it's the next episode, I can't remember, they bleed together, Picard is faced with the worst of humanity through Guinan's examples of why everything's the way it is. And then you have Rios encountering someone who is virtuous, desperate to help, all that stuff. And Teresa, she mm. is a doctor with a free clinic. She patches up people that can't get help anywhere else because they don't have the money or they're the wrong race, that kind of stuff. So she's that example of, here's why our future can exist. Because people like her exist. And there'll be more than her out there doing this or similar things that's why we get there that's how we get there because people like her exist once you've made that point Teresa is no longer needed because what else does she do other than set up the bizarre 
development that Rios decides to stay behind. And again, any scene between them, really good. But I think it would have been more prominent if they'd made that point about, here's someone who's effectively ahead of her time here, making waves, making society better. We need people like her around. Cool. So glad I met her. But having her still there at the end of the season, you're not really doing anything. You're just making her this love interest, which takes away from the nuance to who she was that was set up earlier. Yeah, they turn her into the love interest. They also go back on a lot of the... It's the little ripples in the timeline. We can't expose people to the fact that we're from the future. We can't leave them with extra information or tell them more. And then slowly through the season, it's like, yeah, we're going to let her handle advanced medical equipment we're going to let her know that we're from the future but there were other places you could have gone you've got all the medical tricorders and everything yourself so why go back to the surgeries it was that element where you're thinking oh really i get the romance angle at that point and he's decided to stay back because they sort of force it by the end but that wasn't necessary but especially once he takes them back to the ship for example. At that point, it's just, oh, yeah, yeah, we're from the future. Let me just show you everything at this point. <laughs> Why not? Which is what Kurt did with What's-Her-Name in Star Trek Four, the whale biologist. <laughs> Although eventually they just had to tell her the truth because otherwise they weren't going to get her help. Whereas, again, Teresa wasn't important from a narrative standpoint at that point. She wasn't needed. Like you say, the medical instruments. Rios is better equipped to use them than she is, even though he's not a doctor. Beam me this weird device that can stabilise Picard here. Teresa, you use it because you're a doctor. Yeah, but what the hell is this? Just point it at him and press the button. Job done. Apparently it's point and click, all the medical technologies. Apparently I could be a doctor in Starfleet because you just open the thing and hold it over their face and hit a button. It's done. It's knowing what to point and click or what setting to have it on, though. That's what makes you a doctor. Yeah, but she definitely doesn't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She hits the button and all the prongs come out and all the stuff happens. And you're like, really? That is really intuitive technology, that. You've got to give Starfleet credit for making something really intuitive. It was one of those where you're going, uh, really? Are dealing with Rios's injury at the beginning? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. But suddenly using Starfleet medical technology from way 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 into the future just seemed a bit or confederation medical from, technology or confederation medical technology of course yeah i'm forgetting <laughs> it just seemed a bit out of pace there it was to give her something to do it was transparently to give her something to yes do. there's got to be a reason for her to be here if we just get rios to do everything then she's just a spare part at this point and i think that's the point that you were making overall is that really she was a spare part i kind of thought they were going to take her with them at one point mm. that would have made sense yeah we've shown you too much to leave you behind now we've got two choices we can shoot you or we can take you with us yeah although that means there's one less really good person out there fighting the good fight so that's not helpful for the timeline in any way <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unless our son yeah, you have to take him to i guess rios for his instant family i kind of thought they were going to set up rios becoming his own grandfather at one point maybe that still <laughs> happens i just don't mention it do you know what? It did cross my mind going, oh, really? Is this the way they're going to bit you? I did like, he died in a bar fight trying to get medical supplies across the line or whatever. Died with a cigar in his mouth. Died the way he lived. Well, I suppose that's comforting in a way. Is it? I don't know. He just dies in some bar fight. He was the captain of a starship. Is this really a trade-up? <laughs> Is it a trade-up? Yeah, I mean, I guess he died fighting the good fight rather than he got hit by a bus because he was looking the wrong direction when he was crossing the road. So that's I suppose, a more fitting end for him, I guess. I guess, yeah. Do you prefer to hear he also died of old age with his family and loved ones around him rather than he died in a bar fight? Yeah. Turns out his descendant turns out to be, oh God, himself. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Just this weird loop that they've set up. They didn't really go with that. I suppose it could still be the case. My headcanon is that he is his own grandfather or great-great-grandfather or how many greats you need to put in front of it. However many of those, he is that to himself. Just like Fry. <laughs> but it's valid headcanon. Yeah, why not? Not really any more to say on Rios. We'll probably touch back on him when we talk about the bookending scenario that the season does. But Seven and Rafi, I suppose they come under one bracket because they're setting up a relationship or continuing a relationship, I guess. I liked what they did with Seven in this season. The loss of her Borg implants gave her this new lease on life, gave her this freedom to engage with her humanity. She was the one that was really personable with people and managed to be kind and get information and get results that way which is a bit counter to what you would expect from seven although i do think they wasted the fish out of water aspect 
on these characters because they act like such contemporaries anyway that they just effectively blend in. You did have a couple of moments with that where it was at Seven said something about we want to go up to the roof to take a digital photograph or something like that. She uses some really weird, not quite right terminology. But other than that, they blend in pretty well. And even if she had had her Borg implants, would anyone have really batted an eyelid? Probably not. <laughs> It would have been a little bit of a batting of eyelid, but yeah, I kind of agree the fish out of water thing was missing, and I don't know if it's despite how long the season felt. It was like they did it as a fast-forward element. We can't have them stumbling about clueless the whole time, so we're just skipping it. We're not really going to cross it, because there wasn't any sign of, oh yeah, by the way, we'll need credit cards, or we'll need money, or it just wasn't really thought about from that angle there wasn't too much clunky dialogue like you said the only bit was that sort of thing about the digital photograph her suddenly realizing that people were treating her differently i think she said a line of oh normally when i speak to people they move back they're more scared of me but actually they were more willing to talk i like that element of it i thought that was done pretty well Although I think people would have just dismissed it in the 21st century as a piercing. Mm. Some weird face art that she had. A very elaborate piercing. <laughs> yeah. What's that thing above your eye? It's a piercing. Okay. Mm. We have people like that here. It's fine. People have some pretty elaborate facial art and so forth. So I don't think it would have necessarily caused as much of a stir as they thought. But yeah, they wanted the Seven is human for the first time in her life, really. She looks human. She's at ease with herself because in the first episode you have that ham-fisted you're a Borg. And she's like, no, I'm not. I'm ex-Borg. You get all that. And then when she gets her implants back, which I just thought was so bloody stupid, it's the same configuration of implants that she had before in exactly the same places because she gets healed. Mm. It's narrative shorthand to say, oh, look, she's back where she started in that way, but not really because she's learned a lot. And then you have this weird last minute thing that they chuck in where Rafi says, you'd make a great captain. And then she says, Starfleet wouldn't let me in. Janeway threatened to resign over it. They wouldn't let me in because they were afraid of my ex-Borg status. And the more and more I think about it, the more you see Starfleet and the Federation making decisions out of fear and weird intolerances that they seem to have. So we saw it in this, or we have it mentioned in this, where we can't have a Borg on the team. Sorry, you're not allowed. And then you had the synth ban last season, which was a fear-driven response to an attack. Genetic engineering keeps coming up. That's prohibited. Again, out of fear of something that happened centuries ago. Something that is also brought up in Strange New Worlds. The genetic mm. ban and so on. It paints Starfleet and the Federation as being this weirdly, selectively tolerant organisation. Rather than, we're open to all. It's an interesting take. I'd like to see them actually really do something with that in one of the shows. It would be interesting to see it covered. It kind of upset me a little when I heard that line. It's another one of those ones, a bit like the last season, where you catch up with uh, Picard's former crewmates and find out that they've all had very depressing times since they left the Enterprise. Yeah. We already knew that Seven of Nine had not had an easy time of it because I think her introduction in the last season was her killing Ichab. So it wasn't exactly that her life was all sunshine and delight when she entered into season one either but with this you're kind of like oh so after all of that on voyager and everything that she went through at that point when she got back to the federation after serving on a federation ship for x amount of time she gets back and gets told oh no you can't join starfleet sorry nah you're off go away you're done thank you very much for all your hard work off you pop we're not gonna do it and you sit there and think it's another one of these oh so oh we... on that same line i'm trying to work out what happened to all the marquee crewmates when they came back <laughs> Did they all get thrown in prison? Well, we know from, or you don't, because you haven't seen it yet, but from Prodigy that Chakotay was allowed to join the team again. Oh, well, that's fine. But he always had a special place in Jamie's heart, so that's fine. <laughs> he was the only one. It was because he still had the Starfleet commission, so they just recommissioned him. But everyone else, nah, in prison. Everyone else, no, nope, you're out, done. <laughs> I just thought it was a bit of a shame. You picture certain outcomes for characters when you watch a TV show, like the end of Voyager or whatever, and you sit there and think, I wonder what happened to those characters next. And when you hear that they got rejected by Starfleet and Jane, we had to threaten to resign. But not actually do it, crucially. Not actually do it, because she's still there. <laughs> and then Seven, oh, it's not worth it, I'm off. And did her own thing. And you go, okay, well, good on her, I guess, but that shouldn't have needed to be the situation. I'm a bit with you. I'm going, Starfleet don't always make good calls. We've seen that through the shows. I always talk about the very silly admirals in Starfleet, so I guess it tracks, but still. It didn't seem to be where they were going with the whole Seven of Nine plot or the Voyager plot. The whole idea no. was they were going to find a place for these people. 
when they come back, which includes Seven. Maybe they're happy to let her operate as a civilian scientist, but no, you can't be in Starfleet. It's going to freak people out. You can't be a captain. We couldn't ever put someone who was a Borg in charge of a ship. But also, it was a bit out of nowhere, this, I really want to be a captain, but Starfleet wouldn't let me. That's why I left. And it's just to set up that moment where Picard field promotes her and lets her Mm. sit in the chair because she's an expert on the Borg and then does nothing with that expertise in that sequence at all. She just sits there. But it creates this desire in one episode that then gets carried into the next episode. It's almost as if it's a throwaway line that was thrown in because they've done this bit in the final episode. They filmed all the Stargazer scenes together, so we need to set this up somehow. And, oh, crap, we forgot to set up that Seven wants to be a captain. Quick, chuck that in the previous episode. The thing is, if that was all it took, why did Janeway threaten to reside and not just always take Seven on dangerous missions and give her a fuel commission? <laughs> Because she's not Picard, that's why. She's not Picard, that's why, yeah, okay. It's Picard's world, we're just living in it, apparently. <laughs> or it's all a fever dream. <laughs> Who knows? But I liked what they did with Seven this season, broadly speaking. I did quite like that she was more human than she's ever been. And mm. I think there's some better ways they could have done it, because you had the bit where Rafi was shouting at the woman at the desk, and they were trying to find Rios, and the woman wasn't cooperating. But Seven does thank her for her service and say she's doing a good job and so on. But I think they could have done more with that by acknowledging that Seven is white, pretty and blonde and Rafi is not white and blonde. So therefore people might not engage with her in the same way. And as soon as Seven goes up, bats her eyelashes, asks a couple of questions, she gets exactly what she wants. They could have done that. I think that may have made the point a bit better. But Rafi, she needs to learn the lesson. Don't shout at the person at the front desk. That means they won't want to help you. Don't yell at the customer service person. It's a lesson everybody should learn. It's a lesson everybody should just know. Because if you're being difficult, they won't want to help you. Simple as that. And Rafi, they played around with the fact that she was being manipulative. She's feeling guilty because Elnor dies. She also feels guilty because she laid it on thick and got him to change his plans and go to Starfleet. Because she wanted him there, not because he really wanted to be there at that time. That's thrown in. I thought that was okay. And it does actually back up the way Rafi's portrayed in the previous season. There is an episode, I can't remember the reason she does it, but she's manipulating Gerati a little bit. It shows that she has that potential and that capability. So that was okay. It was something she needed to learn about herself, but I don't think she ever really does anything with it. Yeah, no, it's true. She does have the capacity to be manipulative. I think it gave a stronger justification. At first, you obviously get the impression that, oh, she's become a lot closer to him over the passage between seasons. You get a little bit of that. When he gets hurt and when he eventually dies, you get that really powerful thing that she was there at that moment. They couldn't help, they couldn't divert power. So you get all that pressure put on her at that point. To then add into the fact that she did a little bit of emotional blackmail to get him to stay and not delay his plans by a year and go off somewhere else because she wanted him to be around. She didn't want to be left alone after Seven had decided to go off as well. I thought that worked well. You've just got to try and fill in gaps between the two seasons, I guess, with some of it. Yeah, because the second season picks up the characters at a point where they weren't at the end of the first season. Mm. So there's an entire season of television, really, that's happened in between times. Yeah. Such as Laris's husband dies between seasons. Yeah. (laughs) Poor guy. He was in three episodes before. That's a shame. We should care about that. Where is he? He's dead. Okay. He's dead. And now Picard has the hots for you. Anyway, (laughs) moving on. (laughs) But it's okay, because in Romulan culture, it's the custom to move on from a romantic relationship when someone dies to someone else. Thank God for that. That would have been really inconvenient. (laughs) Yeah, so Romulan culture is on our side here, guys. It's fine. Rafi gets a bit of closure on her grief in two instances, but one of them is when, for some reason, the ship, La Serena, has taken an imprint of Elnor and built an entire combat hologram out of it. And that imprint has made observations about the way that the real Elnor and Rafi interacted before Elnor died and says... Something along the lines of, well, based on what I saw, he didn't hold you in contempt. He had no regrets, so you're okay there. That's really sketchy if you're on a starship and it's recording every movement, every word you say, and can generate a facsimile of you as a hologram after the fact. 
That's worrying. Especially within the short time that he was on the ship, because like you said before, that wasn't the normal universe La Serena. That was the Confederate version. <laughs> it's only had that passing glance at him at the best. Yeah, he was only on for like five minutes during yeah, the escape, he was on for wasn't five he? minutes, and a lot of that was him <laughs> dying rather than yeah. doing anything else. So <laughs> it's like, really? You sit there and go, okay, I guess. I did like when he was on screen, and I felt kind of cheated for the fact that he wasn't there for a lot more of the season. I really liked Elnor as a character. I thought, oh, this is different. He's a little bit of a different character from the usual. I mean, he's an elf, right? Yeah, pretty much. He uses yeah, a sword. I think there was a conscious effort to push Elnor and Soji into the background a little bit because as actors, they're not as good as everybody else. The actor mm. who plays Elnor is a bit rough and I think there was a conscious decision to do that. None of those actors are going to be in the next season, by the way, apparently. Oh, really? Evan Evagoria, I think his name is, and Issa Briones, they're not going to be in the next season, reportedly. Neither is Alison Pill, which kind of makes sense, although also doesn't make sense, but we'll get to her. Yeah, so Elnor dies and then doesn't die when they get back to the present day, their own present day. Q's surprise was... I've revived Elnor, therefore rendering your entire emotional arc pointless because he was going to survive anyway. It's all good. And he's on the excels here, not calibrating the shields properly. So great to have him back. He almost made this whole thing fail. Cool. Yeah, great to have him back so he can <laughs> recalibrate the shields wrong. So ridiculous. <laughs> so that's really all there is to Rafi, I think. The fact that she gets called out for being manipulative, struggling with her grief, and her and Seven decide to embark on a relationship at the end of the season, which they were dancing around for the rest of the season. Fine. I think they were a good double act, though. The two actors, I think they bounced off each other really well. And for quite a vast chunk of the season, they were the ones that were carrying the plot. They were the ones that were forwardly moving things. (laughs) Yeah, 100%. I think what I like about them both is they are both capable people. It's not that one is holding the other up. They both have strengths, and they both know how to use each other's strengths through that and i think that part of the dynamic worked pretty well they were able to play each other that way they didn't over egg the relationship or the fact that they had tried and failed initially to get the relationship underway there was a few moments where it was like we can't speak about this just now or we shouldn't speak about this at the moment or this is really inappropriate they would go part way into it and then have to actually get back on with what they were doing so it was a lot of not now and then moving on but apart from that element of it i think you're right they both bounce off each other well yeah and they were the one trying to hunt down jurati slash borg queen so like i said they were carrying the plot the only movement that was happening was with them well you had picard off being interrogated in an fbi dungeon or whatever <laughs> whatever nonsense the other characters were getting up to yeah. just standing around well the, yeah because the, the first bit was them trying to find rios because they've been separated from rios for a bit then it was jurati they were the people finders for the majority of trying to track down the what was it they call them the watcher yes when they were looking for Gainan originally or not Gainan sorry they were looking for uh, Talon I know it was Gainan Gainan and Talon were connected yeah. until they weren't yeah. <laughs> until they weren't until it was inconvenient and then it was just one yeah we will talk about Jurati and the Borg Queen I promise listeners let's talk about Soong at the moment though I didn't think much of this version of Soong I quite liked him in the first episode he appeared where he was getting his funding taken off him because he's a crackpot and research is too dangerous and so on then they reveal that his daughter has a genetic illness that his research is all about curing and he's not allowed to do that. That set him up as a bit of a tragic figure. And then he became a weird moustache twirling villain shortly after that. I even liked it when Q came to him saying, do what I want and your daughter will be cured. And he even admits, well, I'm a hostage to you then. It's that resignation. And then it just seems like he's pretty up for it after that point, bizarrely. But his desire to be relevant that kind of comes from nowhere. You can have this utopian future where you don't matter, or you can have this dystopian future where you do. Which one do you want? And he's like, yeah, give me the dystopia any day of the week, as long as I matter. I think there's added nuance to the character through the way that Brent Spiner performs him. So you get a sense that he maybe cares about Corey and the other children that died. And even the whole, this is the last one. Even he has an ethical boundary that he doesn't want to cross. This is it. I'm not doing this again. I can't emotionally handle this again. Still horrible what he's doing, creating these people to be experiments that then fail and their failure means their death, but they're still people. But the fact that he had a limit, I found interesting. And again, it's like with a lot of things, it's weird because they had so much time this season to flesh out all of this stuff, but they ended up not doing it. So then you just have, you've got a scene with Soon, 
What point does this have? Okay, none. Moving on. You've got Corey finding out about her origins and her potential quest for identity. What are you going to do with that? Pretty much nothing. And so on. So I had issues with the way Soon was handled. And I do think he had the potential to be a really interesting antagonist, but never got to rise to that occasion. Yeah, I agree with you with that. I understand his willingness to go along with Q because, like you say, he's promised this cure. He's given a sample of it. It works. This changes everything. I will do anything for my daughter element to him. But his turn into full-blown villainy, okay, I'll do this for my daughter, and then it suddenly turns to, oh, I'm not doing this for my daughter. I'm doing it so that I matter in this future world. No matter what it takes, no matter who I need to kill, I'm going to blow up a shuttle going on the Europa (laughs) mission. I'm going to do all of that. I'm going to throw all my money behind this project somehow to get my way in there. A lot of that just didn't make sense to me. He's shown as being capable at certain points, and he's shown as having, like you say, that emotional limit where he'll go, I can't do this, I can't continue to do this. But then on the other hand, he's like, I don't care how many people I damn in the future, as long as I come out top dog at the end of it then i'm okay with it he didn't track for me through the season i thought there was some good bits in his performance like i said at the beginning in the spoiler free bit i thought there was some good performance elements there was some good lines in there there was some good bits but you sit and you go overall for the whole season it was like oh it's another soon scene all right okay where's this bit going especially when you're seeing major developments happening in episode eight episode nine you're sitting there going they can't conclude this in any satisfactory way because they've only got one or two episodes left to try and fit this in and it's happening as C-plot and amongst everything else that's going on. They can't give it that depth because they've wasted time doing other things. Yeah, you have that bit where Corey runs out on him and then she's not seen again for weeks until the final episode. Yeah, she's not seen until she pops up in the library. And the idea is that she's getting guidance originally, we think, from Q. Is that the impression that we're supposed to get at the beginning there? I'm trying to remember now. Does Q give her the cure initially? Q gives her the cure. That was hard to say. Yeah, he does that. (laughs) He's the one that lets her out. Is that so she can wind up as one of the travellers? Is that why he does that? To complete that? Who knows? It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, because what benefit does it have for Q at that point? Surely he still wants Soong on his side. Yeah, how's it going to help him to upset Soong? It doesn't yeah, make any sense. At that point, Soong is then getting pushed even more unstable. So it's not helping his cause. He's already got him wrapped around his finger. So why release her at that moment? Unless he knows that she's going to get picked up by the travellers. But it just didn't make sense. <laughs> I didn't get it. I'm glad you mentioned the donation part because I'd forgotten about that. But I do remember thinking at the time, weren't you just disgraced? Weren't you just called out as being a mad scientist and all your research pulled, all your funding pulled? You're a joke within the scientific community. NASA will hear about that, surely. And when he comes up offering donations, we don't want to associate ourselves with this weirdo. We don't want to associate ourselves with this scientific footnote, this joke. That didn't make sense, where all that funding came from. Yeah, and, oh, we're so grateful. We really, really want your funding. You did hear it's launching in like a couple of days, buddy. You're a bit late with your funding. (laughs) But I'm sure we'll spend it on some nice desk lamps around about here. It's about to take off. That element for me was a bit, uh, okay. And surely there's other people flashing cash and stuff about higher than him. The fact at the end, it's like, oh, you've been invited to the launch. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, I'm just going to break protocol and go through all these doors and go here and, oh, I'm just going to leave you here and I'm going to go off by myself. Thanks very much. It was funny, but it didn't make sense. You watch it, you go, no, this wouldn't happen. What's the, can I get five minutes with the astronauts? No, they just came out of quarantine. Does my funding not entitle me to five minutes with the astronauts? No because they just came out of quarantine. We don't want you giving them the flu or something. We don't want you giving them COVID and them taking that into space. We don't want that happening. As far as I know, that is sort of standard procedure for space missions like that. Yeah, you put them in a bubble and then you take them to the ship. They do like pose for photographs and stuff before missions and things as well, but it's it's a contained situation, isn't it? It's not 
you were going to let them mingle with the general public two days before the mission or the day of the mission. We don't want people getting sick. Yeah, they go into their quarantine because they don't want them catching anything before they go into orbit. Because they're just going to give it to everyone else and there's no way to treat them once they're up there. So they go into quarantine and pictures and stuff get taken, but a lot of the time that gets done through glass or it gets done by NASA personnel inside the quarantine who are also not leaving or are fully hazmated up. So that breaking existing protocol, never mind future space protocol, it just seemed like a weird bit for them to be throwing in. It's all very, very strange. Then soon having the special ops contact so you can get the special forces Borg drones involved. Where did he get this? He's just genetic scientist. Why has he got this kind of access? Again, you're disgraced. When you become disgraced, typically your contacts all dry up. At that point, it's, no, no one will return my phone calls. That's usually the problem. And that's where Q steps in, surely. Or that's where Q should step in. I'm going to offer you this lifeline at the point where you have nothing. But a lot of the resources being used seem to be because of who he is or the influence he's supposed to have, which again, just got taken away from him. Yeah, it doesn't seem to track. When did you ever get Black Ops contacts? <laughs> what have you been working on? Well, you could say similar for the drones as well. The armed drones. You kind of see that he's got the solar protection outside the house, the filters, the air filtration, and the drones that do all that. So I suppose it's maybe a weaponized version of something like that. Anyway, let's just go with it. Mad scientist does mad stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was okay with the concept of the drones attacking the Europa mission. I just think the execution of it was awful. It was just busy work for the characters that weren't Picard and Talon. And Picard mm. was only with Talon because he jumped into the smoke before she had the chance to react. So he's not even supposed to be there. But... The others, they go to Soong's lab and they have to solve this problem. But it's all just techno babble nonsense, isn't it? It's the same as in the bad episodes of Voyager. It's the reroute power to the main deflector dish and fire a blah, blah thing. And then Harry Kim presses a few buttons and then it happens. And Well, we've got out of that, Captain. Well done. Job done. We're safe now. It was a bit like that. We can't get control of the drones. And then Rafi's like, hang on, I'll rewire it. And then she rewires it. And then Rios is like, I can control one drone. I'll just crash it into the others. Job done. There's no tension. There's no threat. There's no character to it. Dramatically, emotionally, it's adding absolutely nothing. They're just sitting there and they're just playing with drones. That's it. It was the line, we can't tamper with them because if we tamper with them, they'll blow up. That's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Solved it. They'll blow up with us in it, but fair enough. If <laughs> that's the way it goes. Set something up so it's going to tamper with it on a timer. It's a set of scissors are going to cut that wire and it's going to take two minutes for that to happen, or it's going to take 30 seconds for that to happen. Cool. So while that's about to happen, we're going to run. <laughs> then these drones can blow up. Yeah, or even then, you wouldn't have got the Talon Talks to Renee scene, but it could have been, I'm going to give my life saving Renee's life by destroying these drones, by being in this room, because I have to be in this room for some reason. It's like at the end of Discovery Season 2, where they can't get a door shut for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> no 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 the controls are on the inside they have to be pressed on the outside next time we're in space dot we'll get some controls on the outside we'll get that sorry it's a bit of a design flaw there but there was no threat to that because the characters were just shouting and then playing about with wires and then rios was on his joystick and that was it and there was nothing to that but i was okay with the drones as a threat and it's a good idea for someone like soon to have a backup plan in case the neurotoxin doesn't work so that makes sense and I actually thought he was a competent villain in the Borg attack episode as well. I mean, it wasn't terribly intelligent stuff, but he figured out that Picard used a secret passageway because he noticed the disturbance on the floor and stuff. He was a smart pursuer, which was good. Mm. And I suppose it gave the Borg some personality because he was their general, so to speak. Yeah, it was to basically be the sinister presence because you couldn't have the Borg Queen walking about doing it at the same time or Jurati walking about doing it at the same time. So you needed that other person for Picard to actually face while that was going on rather than it just being the faceless Borg members. The mini collective. Did they have to assimilate them? Could they not have just been special forces guys? But they would have just done it anyway, wouldn't they? Well, they were getting paid. <laughs> that was the paid. point. They were promised money. Weird stuff in the finale. Again, when they're boosting the whole predestination plan that a part of that came out of nowhere. The idea that, well, before my family moved back into the chateau, we discovered bullet holes in the walls, and those were those bullet holes. So that must mean that this was supposed to happen. What about the Borg corpses that were beamed into the basement? <laughs> what about those? <laughs> when were they discovered? 
Were those there when you were there? Beam them into space. I do like the idea of just using the transporter to half materialize someone inside a wall. That is something that they should probably do more often. That solves a problem for you quite readily, doesn't it? But it does risk messing up the timeline because, well, when the Picard family comes back here, they're going to discover all these corpses in the walls. Yeah, or all the components that were attached to the corpses in the walls. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're just not going to mention that. But the place was shot up and those are the same bullet holes. Cool, okay. I actually always thought that when Picard's brother and nephew and his sister-in-law died, that it was in the chateau and then the one in Picard has been rebuilt. That doesn't seem to be the case. To be fair, it was never canonically established where they were when they died in a fire. So I'm okay with that. But it was a bit of a surprise. Mm. But again, no, that's true. they want to retcon his brother out of existence almost, so throwing in a line about this is the original chateau the one i'm living in is a recreation after it burned down because i decided that i would live on the same site that my family were burned to death it's a thing that sane people do but anyway soon is desperation to be relevant was interesting in a way i thought they were going to do more with it and be more significant within the season where his only real purpose was to run picard over anybody could have done that like i say slip someone a hundred bucks run him over yeah okay <laughs> Send a drone. Yeah. <laughs> Q could have driven the car. <laughs> yeah. Anything could have happened. We talked about this before, but I was half expecting Riker's ancestor to show up to save the day in the final episode, and he looks like Jonathan Frakes. Just really ram it home, yeah. <laughs> and it would tie in with the end of the first season where Riker comes to save the day, which he does in Lower Decks as well. It seemed like we were getting a trend of Riker comes in at the last minute and helps. But nah. Not happening there. So not a lot else to say about Soon. Corey, again, the idea that she was looking for her own identity. She'd been lied to for her entire life. The references to her mother. What was my mother like? No, she didn't exist. I just made you up in a lab. And then the whole Soon seeing himself as a bit of a god because creation is an act of will and I willed you into existence and all that stuff. It was all interesting, theoretically, but they don't do anything with it. And as I say, Corey disappears and then she reappears and joins the Travellers. Weird Wesley Crusher cameo. Yeah, that was a surprise. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because I'd thought it was weird that they hadn't had him in the teaser for the third season. They're fitting in all these original characters and they've not done that. And then he appeared in this. I was like, ah, okay, now it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but he appears in the one scene and then he explains to Corey that she has to join this organisation. I actually quite liked parts of the conversation. The bit where he says it would take too long to explain or it's all very complicated. And she says, well, I don't have anywhere else to be. And he says, well, fair enough, I'll tell you then. I like that they shot down the mystery immediately, the needless Mm. subtext mystery. I think that was a nice call. So that person you've never met, Talon, behind that, the Watchers, they're all my doing, or our doing, the Travellers. It's all connected through me. I don't know how much of the original series you've seen, so I don't know if you know about Talon's connection to the original series. No, I don't. Trivia time. In the original series, there was an episode called Assignment Earth which was intended as a backdoor pilot for a different TV show that was going to be set in the Star Trek universe, but it was going to be set in modern times, modern times for the original series, the 60s. So what happens is Kirk and the Enterprise go back in time for the flimsiest of reasons. The reasons are, we don't remember what happened in the 60s. Could you go back in time and gather some information for us? So they do. They go back in time and do it. It's really weird. It's a backdoor pilot. It doesn't have to be all that well explained. When there, they encounter a man called Gary Seven, and he is what Talon is. He's a watcher. He travels in a less sophisticated looking smoke visual effect, just the same as Talon's transporter. Oh, he doesn't possess people, at least not as far as I remember. I haven't seen the episode in a while. The whole possession thing was very strange, actually. I can think of possibly a dozen examples of when that would have been useful throughout the season. For example, during the party. (laughs) Instead of me going to the party, I will possess someone at the party. Or how about instead of going into the quarantine situation by myself. I'll possess someone in there. The possession only happens to lead Picard to her and then she never does it again. I completely forgot about that. (laughs) Exactly, because it happens once. (laughs) And then they set up the face-changing technology that she was using to hide her face, hide her ears, that she then uses to change her entire face into Renee. Even though Orla Brady and whatever the actress who plays Renee's name is... Penelope something, I think it is, have completely different builds. So apparently it projects an image of the whole thing. Fair enough, it's a weird holographic sci-fi technology. So I don't think Gary Seven does that, although Picard does mention the connection. He's like, oh yeah, Kirk's Enterprise encountered one of you guys. You might not remember that if you weren't really looking for it, but that's what that connection is. 
Okay. You'll have seen Next Generation where Wesley Crusher goes off to join the Travelers. Mm. I think it's the seventh season episode. He's not in the show by that point. He's not a regular anymore. He just comes back for that episode for that to happen to him. And then he's never seen again until a cameo in Nemesis where he's at Troy and Riker's wedding. But he's wearing a Starfleet uniform with Lieutenant Junior Grade Pips. So how are we retconning that out of existence? Just pretend it didn't happen. He doesn't have any speaking lines. He does in a deleted scene, but he's there. He's in a wide shot. You can see him. It's a bit strange, but he's here. Him and his fellow travellers are apparently behind the watchers or whatever they go by so ties that up kind of neatly and Corey's going to be one of them for some reason i don't understand why what quality did she exhibit that makes her ideally suited to be that is it that they just scoop up strays and use them that way which again doesn't make sense for wesley because he wasn't a stray he had some pretty strong connections mm. as you would presume talon does because she's an ancestor of Laris. So by that point, she may have already had children, unless there's a familial connection there where it's her sister or it's Laris's ancestor or something. We're not meant to know that, I suppose, but I suppose the implication with Corey is what we do is we pick up strays and give them purpose, which makes sense for Corey, I suppose, but I don't understand why she's an ideal candidate for it. All she did was delete some files. Yeah, I don't know. My only thing for making her an ideal candidate is the fact that she's a person that doesn't exist, if you know what I mean. I don't know how far her records go as far as being Sung's daughter goes, but she's kind of a ghost of a person, I'm guessing, unless she is officially declared all over the place. I've got no idea. It was kind of the pitch of you will have a happy but uneventful life, or you can go off and have adventures there was that element to it it didn't seem that it was picking up a stray as such as your life is not going to have major consequence on the timeline we can pluck you out at this particular moment and nothing is going to fall apart afterwards sort of legends of tomorrow styley in the first <laughs> season your important work on this earth is now done you've completed everything that you needed to complete in order for the timeline to not be affected and now we can pluck you out if you want but I've just told you that you're going to have a long and happy life, which now means that I've affected all your future decisions because now you know that you're going to have a long and happy life, so you're going to take risks that you wouldn't have taken otherwise and therefore die and have a short, <laughs> and very eventful life. It's that sort of element. So I don't know. It just seemed like, a, oh, we need to explain what happens to this character now because otherwise people are going to wonder what they did for the rest of the timeline. That's all that seemed to me. Couldn't Gainan have explained? Rios went on to do this. Corey went on to do this. Yeah, but did Picard know about Corey? No, he didn't know she existed. Yeah, so Picard wouldn't ask. None of the rest of them would even really know unless they had looked into it. I don't think Sung mentions that, oh, I'm doing this for my daughter. By that point, he's very much, I'm doing this for myself so that I'm relevant. I don't yeah. think he mentions... I need this to cure my daughter or to keep my daughter around. So Picard and the rest of the crew aren't looking for another Sung running about. And they're not looking for progeny or anything. I guess he could have asked Guinan what happened to Sung and she might have said which one or something like that. I don't yeah. know. There might have been a line like that. At that point, her part of that story was done. She didn't have any impact on Picard's side of it. Or there wasn't any cross connection between it. No. And then she agrees to go with Wesley Crusher after a two minute conversation where he gives her a vague explanation as to what she's going to go on and do. He might as well have said, Well, we just lost a member of staff, so we need a new one and you're convenient. Yeah, we need Talon to just died, so, so do you want to do what she does? Who's Talon? Never mind. Just come with us. Never mind, not relevant. <laughs> I've been part of all that has been going on here. Oh, really? I've got no idea what's been going on here because I've been doing my own thing, thanks. <laughs> you know, it's... it's also when it comes to Will Wheaton, and I think it's probably the Big Bang Theory that's done this, but I find it difficult to buy him as an actor anymore because I think he is just so much Will Wheaton now, if that makes sense. Mm. So seeing him play Wesley Crusher, I did a bit of a double take. I know when I look at him, I see Will Wheaton. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, he's played similar... He also played Dr. Parrish in Eureka, and that was very similar again in style. He wasn't doing, like, a different accent or anything weird or wacky from that. You could sort of take little elements of his personality in it. Obviously, it's a different character, and the Parrish character in Eureka was like a very arrogant, self-entitled guy, and that's not similar to Wesley or Will Wheaton in that sense. But yeah, he wasn't doing a weird accent or anything that made you 
think of a different character, I guess. So I guess it's kind of similar. He's in some of Dark Matter as well, isn't he? Yes. Yes, he is. He does a voice in Stretch Armstrong and the Flex Fighters, that Netflix animated show. He's a voice actor in that. I haven't seen him do a lot of acting since Star Trek. So a lot of what I've seen of him is being Will Wheaton. Whether that be his podcasts that I've listened to occasionally or some TV stuff he's done. For example, he does the after show called The Ready Room for this, for Picard. Mm. I think he has gained a reputation as being Will Wheaton since then. Fair enough in very select circles, as in he's become a well-known nerd personality in and of himself. Which makes it difficult for me to see him as an actor. But th- that might just be a me thing and not a universal thing. I don't know. But the Big Bang Theory probably contributed to it because he had a very famous turn in there as a warped-ish version of himself. Yeah, I guess so. I kind of had a little element of that myself. Obviously, he's playing the character, but then at the same time, you can't help but see Will Wheaton. <laughs> yeah, and of course, when you said Gaining could have said which soon, but one thing that soon ends up doing is he opens a drawer... <laughs> and in that drawer, there is a file. It has a date on it, which is 1996. It says Project Can. And at that point, I just about yelled the famous word at the screen because what are they doing here? I am really worried about this because the first episode of Strange New Worlds mentions the eugenics wars and mentions it as part of the whole malaise around World War Three. It's all part of the same thing. So according to Strange New Worlds, the Eugenics Wars happens later than Star Trek canon would have you believe. Whereas previous Star Trek canon, when they awakened Khan, he was from 1996. That's when he left Earth. When he was losing the Eugenics Wars, he left Earth. So they're pushing that later for some reason. And the reason this reference doesn't work is because it's not clear what the reference means. So is he looking at this file of something that's already happened? Or is he looking at the file in order to create Khan for World War Three purposes? And the fact it's a funding report from 1996, is that funding still set aside? Probably not, if it was never funded. Also, what's it doing in his drawer? Why does he have it? And why does he open the drawer and it's there? Did Q put it there? Who knows? So many questions around it. But one thing I'm really worried about is that at some future point, whether it be in this show, Strange New Worlds, or some other iteration of Star Trek, they're going to bring Khan back. We're going to have to put up with this again. Another dull monotonous, meaningless interpretation of this character. And I'm not for that. But I feel like that reference is exactly the same reaction as Into Darkness would have fostered in the audience. So I always say this, the reaction in Into Darkness is twofold. Half of your audience who are Star Trek fans who know who he is will say, oh God, not this. And the other half will say, who? So the chunk of the audience that are watching Picard that have never seen Next Generation or any other Star Trek They must exist, but I can't imagine why. Is there anything for you in here? That'd be an interesting perspective to learn about. But there's no clarity around what can is, what the project is, why it's significant. But they have this in here. And also, why does Soong have to be responsible for everything? Yeah, it doesn't seem great to tie him into all that as well. It seems really funny to be, I've digitised absolutely everything and my server has just been completely wiped. Thank God I've got this one thing in a drawer. (laughs) The only document I have left of all my research or all the things that I've been involved in is this one from the 90s. No off-site backup like you would have for research of that scale. Yeah, no off-site backup, no hard drive that I've hidden in a bucket in the garden or something. Yeah, it's all gone. I've got this one thing, which is the details of Project Can, whatever that may have been. I'm like you, I don't know. I don't know if it's just left in as a reference to be like, oh, so he was something to do with that, or is going to be, and they've left it. I don't think they're going to pick it back up. You wouldn't think that that's where this is going next. I'm sure we're going to cover that later in the podcast but it doesn't seem that it's leading down a particular path i'd be slightly disappointed if soong appears in strange new worlds a soong not particularly looking for another one of that but you never know i guess but yeah it seems like you say it's one of those ones where fans will be going oh don't do that again and other people will be like oh what's that referring to all right i guess they just seem to be circling the can references Mm frequently enough for me to worry about it yeah they're getting close enough aren't they yeah so now on to what i would probably call my favorite part of the season 
until it wasn't, the Jurati slash Borg Queen connection. So before I ramble on for a long time about it, what did you think of the Jurati becoming a Borg Queen or connecting with a Borg Queen or merging with a Borg Queen? And <laughs> as a sub-question, when did you figure out that Jurati was the Queen in the first episode? Ooh. I would say, to answer the sub-question first, when I figured it out, it was probably when they were doing the merge, when it became clear that Jurati wasn't 100% in control. It wasn't just her getting away with it. So that was around about the end of the party episode where they went to the gala, because at that point it becomes clear that actually the Borg Queen has got power over her. You can see that this isn't just, a, oh, I've used you and now it's done sort of business there's residual there that kind of made me think oh the borg at the end is it going to be the same borg queen so that was when i maybe had an inkling i don't think i 100 percent knew until maybe an episode or so later when you saw that she was getting further down the line i guess but you had the hint that you've got a new borg queen on the go or something new on the go for me i figured it out in the third episode when she did the partial assimilation thing to get information Mm. Although I already knew at that point that the theory existed. So some people were positing that since the first episode aired. So I don't know if that was an extension of that. But pretty obvious it was heading down that route. It made sense, I suppose. Anyway, I interrupted. So what did you think of this narrative? What did you think of this development for her? I thought it was interesting because I was sort of struggling to figure out why she was there to begin with at the start of the story. I get why everyone else has ended up in this circumstance. I'm trying to figure out why she's lurking about. It was that sort of justification bit at the beginning of the season where it's like we're getting everyone together into this one room again somehow. You know, when like Seven turns up because I happen to be having engine trouble at the same time or whatnot. Okay, I guess. And it was pulling everyone into the same room. So Gerati was one of the ones I was like, I don't quite get why she's there i liked the way this played out i thought it was interesting the dual personality the arguing for control of the body element i did find it a bit weird the borg queen going oh you've got something that i haven't found anywhere else before you're different i could use you you're useful and you're sitting there going how many assimilations have taken place just remind me how many assimilations before this point really (laughs) jurati is she though so yeah there was a little bit of that where i was like "Uh, i don't like that but i liked elements of it shall i say i wasn't 100 percent sold on it but i thought it worked yeah i think the borg queen saying you're the best candidate around plus you really offered to be partially assimilated, so I'll work with this. can definitely work with this. Rather have seven. She seems more useful. <laughs> but never mind, you'll do. The parts I really liked about it were more around poking into Jurati's insecurities as a character. She isn't a character I particularly like, especially after last season where she just gets off with murder somehow, mm. and then they explain it at the start of this season. Yeah, I was being coerced or I wasn't myself or whatever the justification was it's no you were (laughs) the influence may have been external slightly but you still did it and apparently that's fine you can be a consultant for Starfleet again it's fine you don't have to suffer any kind of sentence for this I don't know but anyway when she lets the queen in so that they can get information and the queen breaks her down to her psychological components and tries to control her that way was a really insidious form of assimilation or an aspect of assimilation that we've not seen before actually most of what we've seen before has been the physical as in you get stabbed in the neck with the two injection things and you start sprouting metal somehow (laughs) you grow metal (laughs) out of your body (laughs) fine and they even explain it in this one by stabilizing metals they inject you with stabilizing metals to prepare you for assimilation it doesn't make any sense i will definitely get to that aspect of it but i really like the poking at our vulnerabilities but also Building her up, praising her, making her believe that she matters, believe that she's important because part of the assimilation process is that submission and the bar queen makes her feel good to the point where joining the collective actually sounds like a good idea because our strengths can complement each other. I like that psychological part of it and I thought it played out really well, especially when Jurati thought she could handle it and it's clear that the queen was in control or was seizing control. I thought Annie Wershing was a great Borg queen as well. None of them have been bad, to be fair. Alice Craig, she was really good in First Contact and the Voyager finale. Susanna Thompson, 
who later went on to be a shifty character in Arrow, was really good in it as well, in that role, and that's all we've had. But Annie Wershing was a great take on the character. I liked the arrogance, I liked the holier-than-thou attitude that she had. I love just the pure arrogance that the Borg are better than everything out there, and she's going to force everybody to realise that. I really liked that, and then Gerati, as I said, with her insecurities... She knows she's great. She knows she's a genius. And Picard builds her up a bit as well. Keeps telling her about how capable she is and things like that. But the Queen is inside her head, gets these things about her. And then it sort of flips when the Queen takes over. And you have Seven and Raffi on their Queen hunt. And nice little detail where she knew how to exchange the high heels for sensible boots, but still wear the dress. That was a nice (laughs) little touch. That part was less good, where she was eating car batteries. (laughs) That was... (laughs) Really bizarre. But it was also eating car batteries while very near where she just killed a guy. So she didn't go far, that kind of stuff. And the Queen also facilitating helping Picard, etc. by interrupting the gala formal event thing with bursting into song. I rolled my eyes at that point. That was horrible. It was just a horrible thing to have happen. It's so dumb. Where she starts singing at the top of the stairs and instead of getting arrested by security, they let it happen and the band joins in. Yeah, it's one of those ones where you go, okay. It only happens in TV and film where it's the person appears and decides to start singing a song. The band apparently know exactly when to come in and what their cue is. and What key it's in. What key, <laughs> how to play it in, when she's going to finish, all that sort of stuff. That all just happens. They've rehearsed it as a group, of course. They've rehearsed it as a group. The lighting tech knows to light her on the stairs and dim the lights elsewhere and do the whole thing as if it's all planned. Even when you plan it, that normally doesn't work. <laughs> You've got to have a lot going for you for all that to work. It's... Just stupid. And it's something that you wouldn't expect to see in a serious Star Trek show as well. It it starts verging into parody at that point. Well, it's the thing of, oh, they need a distraction. Well, you could probably blow something up. (laughs) You could probably short fuse something and cause a distraction in a corner. That doesn't seem like it would be too difficult as opposed to, oh, no, I'm just going to sing a song from the balcony. That'll work. (laughs) Yeah. Or turn the lights off. That's fine. You can do that. Yeah, exactly. So dumb. Just so dumb. But that part of it was good. And then it was less good when the Queen had fully taken over and you lose Jurati until you get to the penultimate episode where it's the siege that she organises and you get Jurati properly playing the Borg Queen. I love how she emulates Annie Wershing's mannerisms. I think that was really good. And then she gets to appear inside her head, so to speak, while trying to stop her. I knew you were taking over, so I built all this in. And those endorphins you wanted to releasing me were exactly what allowed me to come back and then convincing her to let's have a better go at the Borg let's do a Borg cooperative instead of collective we'll convince people to join up we'll convince people to give up their individuality we'll offer people second chances we'll rescue people we'll create the Borg as it should be rather than the Borg as it was and the Queen even though she's on the precipice of winning at this point thinks yeah cool let's do that that sounds like a plan (laughs) yeah Like you say, she's on the precipice of winning. It's not that she's in a super compromised position and she's got no chance now. It's like, yeah, I've kind of got this now. (laughs) I've got victory, so no more demands from you. I'm kind of with you. I thought it was well acted, like you say, the point of copying the mannerisms and everything was very nicely done. However, yeah, at the end there, when you get this solution appears... (laughs) And it's like, really? Is this the way this works now? A voluntary collective. So it's taking the dying and the weak and making them strong to then join up as part of it? I don't know. Does it work as a democracy? How does it work now? There was sort of a similar idea in the episode of Voyager where they encounter that derelict cube mm. where the inhabitants of that cube were living on a nearby planet and they were individuals but they were still connected. They would connect to heal each other and stuff like that. Remember mm. when Chicote got mixed up with all them? It seems similar. You don't really get enough context for how this collective works and how successful they were, how much resistance, funnily enough, they encountered when they were trying to build this up. It's a reasonable idea. I just don't think the way that they executed it was very good because it was just, you're going to assimilate this ship and leave and you blow up the Europa mission on your way past and then you'll get to go and put the Borg ahead of schedule by a couple of hundred years by the time you get to the Delta Quadrant and things like that and she just backs down because of this emotional appeal from Jurati this oh no this cooperation thing sounds good you don't get the sense that the Queen is mellowing in any way throughout the season 
No, it seems like a turnaround in that final episode. That seems to be it, the second to last episode. Yeah, okay, fine. We'll change. I need to because we've only got one episode left, so let's do it now. <laughs> let's solve that problem. Because the rest of the time you've got the fact that she's plotting scheming and she's now going to... I'm going to build the Borg better. I'm going to give us all the advanced technology. We can wipe out everyone now before they become a problem and I know all the possible ways this can go wrong already. Which makes you think, how do they keep getting defeated in the first place? I mean, even though Jurati throws in a line and they're about it, it does, doesn't quite seem to be explained. Yeah, you'll always have a Borg Slayer. There will always be resistance. Resistance isn't futile. That idea is fine because the Borg are always encountering resistance. And mm. I do like the idea that being a Borg is seductive, that submitting to the collective is seductive. That is brought up slightly in First Contact where Picard cottons on to the fact that the Queen needs him to willingly submit to her. It's not enough for her to inject him and have it grow metal on his skin. And apparently when he was Locutus, he didn't fully submit. So the assimilation process was never fully complete. That's why it was able to be reversed. So that's all good. I think that's interesting that at some point in the assimilation process, the victim is convinced that this is the best way forward. And in a way, that's what happens to Jurati as well. Because she gets to the point where my body has been taken over by this foreign entity. The best thing for me now is to embrace this and become a Borg. But while I'm at it, let's become a different type of Borg. Let's start things new. Let's do it properly. Let's show it what it could be. Let's go hide off somewhere and build ourselves up to be that ship that you see in the first and last Mm. episode. Let's do that. And it's one of those things that this started... And then 300 years, 400 years later, this happened. It's the in-between bits that you don't get an idea of. Well, apparently it all went swimmingly. (laughs) Apparently. I'm not saying I want to see a spin-off series that's about (laughs) Jurati cutting about the quadrant, rescuing wayward travellers. Yeah, building a new collective. Apparently they managed to do it all fine without impacting the timeline because that's the way it's always been. They've always been in the background being extra Borg. And that somehow the other Borg never, ever, ever found out about the other other collective that was that was running about. They just never noticed. No, Never noticed. Just ignored it. It was all fine. They knew how to stay hidden because Borg and stuff. They changed their Wi-Fi frequency so that the <laughs> other Borg didn't pick up their thoughts. <laughs> changed the password. It's all done. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things that must have seemed like a great idea at the time, but you're never going to get an explanation of how it actually works and how it's supposed to function because even in their most desperate times... Would people submit to being part of a collective losing their individuality? Do they lose their individuality? We don't know because they don't tell you. The voice you get from the Borg ship in the first episode sounds a lot like the voice you get from a standard Borg ship. Mm. So are the individuals but contributing to a collective whole or are they just Borg but they're good Borg? (laughs) And does the Queen get sick of it at some point and try to change the parameters of what it is? Could it have been the encounter with this Borg? Is, oh yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> we just have another equally bad Borg collective out there where the let's be nice plan failed. Mm. I don't know. But I was enjoying the breakdown where Jurati was being slowly mentally assimilated rather than physically assimilated. That was good. And then she just became a walking zombie and the Queen fully took over and she went to Soong and all that stuff. That stuff was less interesting. But the stuff early on was good. Mm. The peeking inside the doors in her mind to figure out the trigger points for her, that kind of stuff was good. But also that Jurati was able to do the same. Yeah, that makes sense. But this forms a big part of the plot. I guess talk about the bookends of the show now, the season now. The season opens with what some fans would describe as everything this show should have been. And I understand that take, although I don't necessarily fully agree with it. We talked about it probably on the Season 1 podcast and before Season 1 came out, the idea of Picard being in a position that you didn't expect from him and operating in ways you wouldn't have imagined he headed was a good idea. It was to give you something different, something unfamiliar, Picard being in an unfamiliar situation. That was all fine. Essentially turning him into Firefly off Star Trek was what I was expecting to happen. He's shaking out of retirement, decides that things don't work the way they used to and he gets on with it. Whereas I think a lot of people wanted it to be, he's Admiral Picard, he's teaching at the Academy, he gets called in for one last mission. And that's what they give you in this episode. There's definite course correction there, right down to when the fleet appears. Because everybody complained about the fact that the fleet at the end of last season was one ship copied and pasted 50 times. Whereas here, (laughs) you get a variety of designs 
which is what people were wanting. And that first episode just reeked of course correction for me. This is, we're going to give you the show that you wanted or that some of you wanted. And to be fair, it worked on me. I really enjoyed that first episode, seeing the new Stargazer Picard gushing about the fact that I was captain of a ship called the Stargazer. How good is that? And Rios is a captain in Starfleet. After being out of the game for so long, he gets back straight into the captain's chair, even though he wasn't a captain before. Okay, I'll allow it. Fine. Seven's out fighting the good fight on her own terms. Jurati's getting drunk on planets. Soji's out. I don't know what she's doing. What is she doing? She's just exploring other cultures? I don't know. But that's the only appearance she's never seen again. Doesn't matter. Rafi's back in Starfleet. She's a commander. Rios gets to be a captain, but Rafi doesn't. For some reason. <laughs> yeah, she stays the same rank. <laughs> yeah. Elnor's a cadet and so on. So you've got this, funnily enough, the next generation. You've got right. the old guard in Picard handing his keys over to a new generation of Star Trek people, of Starfleet people. But he gets called in because his expertise are needed to deal with the Borg, because that's what he does. And I love that. And even the briefing room scene in that episode where they're sitting about debating what to do, mm. Picard's on the side of, I think we should approach this cautiously. The idea of peace is interesting. And Gerati's backing them up. And Seven's like, no, blow them out of the stars. Destroy them. And Rios is like, I just want to protect my ship. What do I need to do in order to do that? That discussion was good. Again, it was classic Next Generation. We have an impending threat just out the window, but let's have a meeting. <laughs> we don't know if they're going to fire on us at any moment, but let's have a meeting. We're about to die. <laughs> Everyone, to the conference room. <laughs> <laughs> Which happens in q Who The Borg Cube's sitting outside. They've just disabled it a little bit. And Picard says, conference. And then they all go and sit and have a chat about it. Huge <laughs> threat outside the window. It just tried to attack you. No, let's get a safe distance. We'll just hang about here. <laughs> But anyway, that was good. It's probably the only time this season that I feel like Jean-Luc Picard was present. Hmm. Even though he was being overly emotional, he was like, oh, I remember when I was captain of this ship, or not this ship, another ship. And they got confused in dialogue. There's one line that refers to it as a refit, and there's another line that refers to it as a new ship. So which one is it? And as a side note, the Stargazer looks insanely clean. I'd be afraid to just stand on it. I'd be afraid I'd be making a mess just by standing there. It is very shiny. <laughs> but a lot of the Starfleet stuff that you see now, even in Discovery and everything, everything's really clean and sterile. There would just be smudges on every screen. Yeah, the Stranger Worlds Enterprise, super clean. When you get a new phone and you peel the cover off it for the first time, as soon as you touch it for the first time, oh, okay, it's ruined, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> it will never be clean again. <laughs> I can scrub and scrub that screen, but... It'll always be pockmarked. It'll always be pockmarked. It will never be new. You can just imagine it's the same on there. Totally get where you're coming from, that it would take a team of, unless in the future they've developed self-polishing metal. There's just Roombas kicking about or low-level phasers. I don't know. doesn't matter. I kind of understand the little robots being able to run about and clean, but they're not doing that all of the time. That's like happening on night shift or when there's no one in the room and stuff. It can't be happening on a regular basis. Yeah, in Discovery they have the dots. They're cutting about doing that. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Just a bit of a nerdy nitpick thing. But <laughs> that first episode of the season, I was really on board with it. And the thing is, my enthusiasm was tempered because I knew the evil timeline and time travel stuff was coming and I felt like I wasn't going to like it. And turns out I was right. But that first episode... Gave me a lot of what I wasn't expecting, that in media res opening of there being an attack on a Federation starship and you see the uniforms and whatever and then it cuts back and then Picard is on the vineyard and talks to Laris and they raise the whole, we should be a couple. No, I'm not ready for that conversation. And then he goes to give that commencement address at the Academy. Again, it's it was all good stuff. The idea of Picard being back in Starfleet, serving that old man function of, yeah, I'll hang around at the Academy and I'll tell people stories. And even like the little bit of advice he gives to Elnor, where he gives him the book that, that Spock wrote. Mm. He quotes it and it's a very Spock way of saying, live a little. It was the idea of enjoying his time at the Academy and things. That was all good stuff. And then you had the anomaly, the big green anomaly open and everyone's like, what is this? We have no idea what it is. It's a big green anomaly. It's probably the Bork. Yeah. It's green. <laughs> it's definitely got the Borg green about it, isn't it? So yeah. let's, let's just assume. Yeah. And then the Borg ship comes through, and even then I was willing to forgive that because you've built some good faith here. I was starting to hope that maybe the time travel stuff will be over by like episode five and we get back to a bit of Star Trek here. That'll be fun. Nah. Nah. It's not what we're getting at all. This is just one episode thing. But did you feel the course correction thing? Do you think there was a conscious effort to try and get fans back in a way by saying, Here's the show that you wanted to see for one episode. I think there was an element of that in there. It was like, here's where you wanted us to pick up 
last season. This is what you wanted as your opener last season rather than picking up with Picard lurking about the vineyard not wanting to be part of Starfleet or doing anything. It's not quite the character that you remember. Whereas this, like you said, I couldn't really have said it much better myself. You've got him filling that sort of dignitary role, that old guard role of let me give you some advice from someone that's been there before. Let me teach future captains how to make decisions and acting as an advisor when stuff happens. They need me to go out and provide a little bit of advice and off I'll go. I felt a bit of that. You got a bit more of a taste of present day Starfleet or the future Starfleet. And I think that helped a bit. The first episode I enjoyed as well. I'm similar to you. I thought, oh, okay, it's an interesting premise. But obviously, by the end of that episode, you've got the, okay, it's a self-destruct and you're into the evil timeline, the dark timeline. That happens within that first episode. And you're like, oh, I kind of liked where we were. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wanted to see more of how that's operating. I don't particularly want to jump right into Dark World. I've only seen one episode of how it's looking a little bit brighter. Because you didn't really have an optimistic impression last season of Starfleet. So trying to get that little bit of, oh, things are looking a bit... And then it's instantly sort of snatched from you and you're like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, it was very disappointing. Because we'd seen the trailer, we knew that the bubble was going to burst pretty quickly. Because you suspect that most of the footage in the trailer is from the first three or four episodes. And again, I was right. The bubble bursts really quickly. And then... It doesn't match up when you get to the end of the season as well, when you return to this moment. So all the characters return. They've changed. They've grown. They are ready to tackle the situation differently, which suggests that they all made mistakes in that situation, but they didn't because they didn't have enough information to go on. So Picard's there. Jurati, I know it's you. What is going on here? And Sivan has learned to not hate the Borg somehow. All this stuff. It's all cool there. Rios isn't there, which really confuses his crew. Not that Picard's prepared to explain it. Admiral, where's Captain Rios? Shut up! Shut up! That's an order. Just get back on the job. Imagine being at that debriefing after this. Okay, so what the hell happened? And then they explain it. How about we just agree never to speak of this again under penalty of death? Just like in Discovery Season 2. We're still not talking about that. Yeah, let's not talk about this like we don't talk about Mushroom Drive anymore. (laughs) It not matching up when they come back. And the thing is, the characters haven't really... Like, Seven not hating the Borg is not the Borg. Once they know it's Jurati that's in there, they're not facing the same Borg that they were before. So it's more like, okay, well, now I'm intrigued as to why now and why you've decided to show face after all this time. He still was probably wrong to cancel the self-destruct to an extent because you're sitting there going, well, you're taking a hell of a gamble here, Admiral. Also, when the other Starfleet ships contact them and say, what's going on? If you don't respond, we'll assume you've been compromised. And Seven says, tell them that we're actively negotiating with the Borg. And they just accept that at face value. But also, at that point, aren't all the Starfleet ships hacked? So can they do anything about it anyway? They kind of forgot what happened earlier in the season at the end of this one. Yeah, because the idea was that all the comms lines and everything were down. They couldn't speak to anyone. It was at the point of, yeah, we need to self-destruct to stop this happening. Because we decided to fill all our ships with Borg technology that can be easily hacked by other Borg technology. That seems to be a really good idea. Seems really convenient. (laughs) (laughs) So dumb. And the situation itself, if you scan over here, you'll see that this massive anomaly has appeared out of nowhere. Not unlike the massive anomaly that was terrorising us in Discovery Season 4, which is obviously set a few centuries after this. But it's an anomaly that comes out of nowhere. Did it just spring out of nowhere? Has it just appeared? Was it just appearing at that point? Or was it there and they missed it? It's pretty huge. How did Starfleet sensors miss it? And... Why didn't Jurati Borg lead with that? Yeah. Instead of <laughs> popping out of the transwarp conduit, beaming aboard the Stargazer, attacking, sticking her tentacles into the helm or whatever she did to get power, why not lead with, hi, we're nice Borg. If you turn your sensors to this sector, you will see that there's a big anomaly that's probably going to destroy a lot of planets. What I'm here to do is coordinate all of our shields so that we can absorb the impact of this planet-destroying weapon, apparently, or planet-destroying whatever it is. What is this anomaly? We don't know. We'll explain next season, probably. But it's now turned into a transwarp conduit that hides a threat. It's probably can, let's face it. It's going to be... He'll be behind it somehow. None of that made any sense. I was just laughing throughout the whole scene, and I think I started laughing at the point where, where's Captain Rios? And it's, stay on task, Helm. That's an order. He hasn't even learned her name. 
It's just helm. Peasant, do your job. You have a couple of people at the back of the bridge thinking, I don't want to speak out, but I think Admiral Picard has gone insane. He's talking about songs that comforted him when he was a child. He's talking about emotional well-being. He's talking about all sorts of weird stuff. Also, why is he not wearing a uniform? Why did he get to come on the ship just wearing his casuals? He was wearing a uniform at the Academy. Why is he not wearing it here? Good point, well made. I didn't think Gerati appearing and going, oh yeah, by the way, this is the reason that we're here. Or was it so that she could draw as many ships out as possible? If a single Borg appears and appears non-threatening, that Starfleet would be like, oh, yeah, our ships are still scattered everywhere where instead they've got the big Amada pulling up. Well, reinforces were, you have to assume, already on their way. Mm. Reinforcements, sorry. Because they send more ships once they realise it's a Borg ship. All she does to do is keep quiet until that happens, or start the negotiations when it's just one-on-one. Yeah. And then explain everything. But then you wouldn't have the whole bloody time travel plot and whatever nonsense they get up to. Because we could have stayed in the optimistic happy universe for <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's not A goes to B goes to C. It's like C goes to B goes to A storytelling. We need this to happen because we've already decided that we're going to go do this. So this is why it happens in this way, even though it doesn't make any sense. And like I say, that anomaly. What is it? And why did they miss it? How was that missed? Because it was just scan here. It's like, oh yeah, there it is. But you've got sensors actively scanning space all the time. Starfleet are dumb. Yeah, it didn't quite make sense from that point of view. You know, you've just got to take it that maybe the Borg have got more advanced or adjust sensors and were able to predict that it was going to appear because it wasn't there, but then it was. It definitely wasn't there during the whole chaos of the yeah. self-destruct situation. and People definitely died. Jurati Borg definitely killed some Starfleet officers, but no, that's all forgiven. Can I have provisional membership in the Federation? Picard's like, yes, because I have the authority to grant that right now, apparently. As an admiral. I'm dishing things out today, so why not? I'm in a generous mood. (laughs) I've just got back from the past. I'm feeling a bit generous with my power. So he goes to speak to his superior, the admiral that's above him in the chain of command. It was the mission, Jean-Luc. Well, a bit ropey. We lost Captain Rios. What happened to him? He lives in the past. Or did. Now he's dead. He died in a bar fight, apparently. So I was told. No, he wouldn't know that at that point, because he didn't find out until he goes to Guinea. But... He lives in the past. He decided to stay there. Okay. I promoted Seven of Nine to Captain of the Stargazer, and that's going to stay in effect forever. But we denied her admission to Starfleet because we're big old racists, apparently. Picard's like, yeah, but I've decided. So she stays. She's now Captain of the Stargazer. Also, the Borg, but not the Borg you're thinking of, are now part of the Federation on a provisional basis. But don't worry, they're just going to hang around at the mouth of this transwarp conduit that hides a threat. We're not going to send anything through to find out what it is, not even a probe or anything. We're just going to wait and see what happens. Are we going to send some other Starfleet ships to man the entry to this conduit? Nah, they've got it. They've got it covered. She's not going to be in season three, so we're not allowed to (laughs) go anywhere near it again. The Borg have got this sorted, so we're just going to leave it. You know how you didn't want a Borg to be captain? Yeah. Well, I made one captain. Oh, and you know how you don't like the Borg? I've made them members of the Federation. Anyway, see you later on. Now that I've updated you. John, look, just go back to your vineyard and please yeah, stop please, getting involved. Please stop making <laughs> these kind of decisions, John, look. <laughs> Good news, though. Q won't be bothering us again. Because he's dead. At least as far as I know. He could be lying. He's done it before. Yeah, but time means nothing to Q. Q can pop up whenever. <laughs> but we hugged, so that's okay. It, it probably means he's really dead. But we have no evidence of that. <laughs> Anything else? How about we just write this off as classified and just never talk about it ever again? <laughs> just please get out of my office, Picard. Am I still needed at the academy? It's like, no, we don't want you teaching any cadets anything. How about no? What about the nature of the mission? Well, I was, I was burying some childhood trauma that I'm now over, so that's good. What I miss this whole thing is, and I had another note about the Stargazer in general. Obviously, the only crew member you know on the Stargazer is Rios. So his crew aren't named, which makes them about as well-developed as most of the Discovery Bridge crew, funnily enough. (laughs) He's captain on this ship, and it's a problem that crops up in Discovery and now this. The chain of command doesn't seem to mean anything in Star Trek anymore. Other than Strange New Worlds, I think they're more or less nailing that. But there's no real formality on the bridge anymore. There's no professionalism as such. In this, you've got Rios sitting on the bridge of the Stargazer, chomping on cigars, speaking Spanish, and generally behaving quite unprofessionally. You get away with this in your own ship, because it's your own ship, you can do whatever you want. It's just really bizarre behaviour for the captain of a starship. Can you imagine Cisco doing that, <laughs> for example? You just know his senior staff and below are making fun of him and their version of 10 forward. And you've seen Rio, seen, seen the nick of this guy. What is he up to? Oh, cigars on the bridge. I really hope they're not real cigars, because... 
They're dangerous, aren't they? It'll be space cigars. You know, the whole symphonal thing. We're not drinking on the job, honest. <laughs> it's fake space cigars, so we're fine. It is funny that you hear Chain of Command getting talked about, but then quite often when you see them interacting, it's them all contradicting that, going behind lines and disobeying orders and <laughs> running off and doing whatever they fancy, really. Or just not behaving as you would expect yeah. in a hierarchy, like with Rios chomping on cigars on the bridge. That's one thing that really annoyed me about it. Mm. But never mind. He's just not there and not explained. The whole crew just scratching their heads, just wondering what's going on. Also, where's other Gerati? She was here a minute ago. Yeah, where's the scientist person gone? <laughs> Really crazy stuff. And then, like I said earlier, the card puts seven in command because there's no one on the ship that has more experience with the Borg, which is probably true, except she has zero experience with this Borg. And does she exercise any of that experience when she's in the chair? No, she doesn't. Like we said earlier on, there's no reason for that decision to be taken at that moment, apart from the fact that they're trying to right a previous wrong, but they're not doing that correctly. It's not Starfleet have changed the system and they're letting Borg be captains now the whole system's fixed any ex-borg can now join starfleet oh no picard has done a quick rule for this field commission which in theory would just be for that particular moment but even then it's the ship needs a captain not a borg there's umpteen other people standing around them who are familiar with the ship current protocols and what's going on other than seven so it just seems a bit odd. And then all it was was to give the order to communicate with the other ships and say that we're currently in negotiations. That, that could have been done by anyone on the bridge. <laughs> he could just shout yeah. that order himself. He didn't need someone else to shout that order. There's an admiral. There's already a ranking officer there. She also wasn't the captain at that point, I don't think. Yeah. Oh, what a mess. What a mess this all is. And then they just basically sit in front of an anomaly and get fired at with their shields up. That's all it is. Yeah. Bunch of ships sitting in front of it, but... Lots of people got excited about all the different ship designs, and yeah, sure. There was some cool stuff I saw on Twitter. Some of the designers from the show basically tweeted out all the different models and the different ships that they had. Oh, they had a blast, didn't they, building that? Yeah, there was quite a lot that went out into all the different ones that had put in. I didn't realise that there had been so much hate over the fleet from the last season. I didn't realise that had been a thing, because I was like, oh, that's quite interesting that they're going into details of all the different ships. I didn't realise that it was to directly compete with, oh, just in case you thought that we made all these the same, here's every individual ship that you can see in this fleet (laughs) and how we've made them all unique. Yeah. It's interesting that the Stargazer's at the front of it rather than the Enterprise. Mm. It's not the biggest. It's not physically the biggest in that fleet, is it? No. It wasn't the closest. It got specifically sent there. You know why it is. It's to draw the connection to Picard's past, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a mess. I'm just going to keep saying that because <laughs> it is. What did you think of the evil timeline then? We haven't actually talked about that at all. It occupied one full episode and about five minutes of another episode. It featured in three episodes, really, but only about a minute of the first one and then almost none of the third one. I was glad that it was just one episode fully spent there, really. I was glad that that was it because I hate these kind of alt world timeline things sometimes it can be interesting just to see the actor stretch the muscles and do something a bit different where they're playing an evil character or an evil version of themselves and all that so it's like okay okay cool i guess but as these alt things it's always well this is no consequence this is about to get erased deleted and gone i don't really want to spend tons of time looking at all this because it doesn't matter it's about to be deleted off you're about to bin it it's not of consequence it's all going to get erased so okay cool it's interesting seeing what's happened right okay let's move along i thought they spent the right amount of time there they spent an episode to establish that it's evil it's different the characters who they've inhabited the bodies of at this point or their other selves have been different picard collecting trophies of his enemies the skulls of his enemies that's dark that is a dark picard i like the fact that they had changed the portrait around because i think they had the one of them in front of the enterprise and then it's changed for like a very like wartime general painting in there i do like that evil picard still likes to lurk about a vineyard with his slaves with slaves to make it a bit different but yeah he's still chilling at the vineyard still is his android body for some reason he still has the robot body I thought that they were going to use this as an excuse to get rid of the robot body, actually. Obviously, with Seven, it's, oh, she wasn't a Borg, so there's no Borg implants. So I thought this was going to be them retconning Picard's 
robot body as well to just go okay because he's in other timelines self's body he is no longer a robot that was kind of what i thought or that q at one point was going to click his fingers and go you're a real boy yeah. and he gets his body from goldacott for some reason because apparently goldacott's well known for making android bodies my interpretation of that line was that he had been injured in some way by gold to cut so it ended up with the robot body rather than he got the robot oh, body through the interaction with the rest of it. I hadn't considered that. Yeah. It's fake though. Yeah, that was my take on it, but I might be completely wrong. It might be that Caldecott is building robot bodies. He's a weird guy. He's into all sorts of stuff. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I thought it was, oh, he had a big fight and he was almost going to die, so they ended up pulling resources together to get his robot body. But presumably that means there's a lot more people rolling about with those robot bodies in this alt timeline if what i'm saying is right it seemed a bit odd to go oh yeah you're still a robot by the way let's clarify this before everyone else questions it <laughs> we need a line in here saying that you're still a robot so here you are you're still a robot <laughs> yeah because we can't just forget about it like everybody wants to for some reason yeah we can't delete it out well you know what would have happened if there was no mention whatsoever about it people would still be like we would be sitting here going well is he still a robot now what happens? Yeah. yeah so i hated the totalitarian timeline stuff and the thing is sometimes even though i don't like that concept i mean i have liked that concept in the past and the mirror universe stories and original series deep space nine enterprise and discovery as well i thought they did a good job with it but there was a lean towards doing darker star trek more evil star trek type stuff in the same way that there's a current obsession with evil superman which i'm sick of as well i didn't find this totalitarian reality in any way interesting they didn't spend an awful lot of time exploring the mechanics of how it works other than picard's a ruthless bloodthirsty general Sivan is the president of the confederation somehow jurati is a lonely researcher that talks to an ai cat voiced by Patton oswalt which i thought was really funny that was a really funny touch elnor is obviously a foreigner rafi seems to be some kind of bounty hunter i guess I'm not sure. Rios is still a captain, so that's fine. And he's on the evil La Serena. It seems unlikely that this version of the ship would be called La Serena, because it seems a bit too nice a name for that <laughs> universe, doesn't it? That time it does a bit, yeah. Basically, most of the characters are in a position of influence, which means there's limited jeopardy, because they're allowed to move around freely. There's no one trying to trip them up, really. You just have Seven's husband, or Annika's husband, confused about what she's doing. But it's not until late, late on that he twigs anything. Even when they try to beam out the Queen and themselves, and that just so happens to be the very second that the security field goes up. It was when it was scheduled to go up. That's what they explained at that point. I thought at that point they'd been rumbled Mm. because they've detected the transporter signal and they're wondering, why is someone trying to beam out the Queen? But no, the husband walked in and Seven was able to talk her way out of it. It's just bizarre. So I didn't really feel the jeopardy. If you look at Mirror Mirror, the original series episode, There's always someone trying to kill Kirk. Every five minutes, there's an attempt on his life. For example, Enterprise, you get the same kind of thing. In the Mirror Universe in Deep Space Nine, there's always some threat, either distant or nearby. But in this, I didn't feel it because no one was really questioning them. Just they were considered to be acting a little bit odd until Picard rallies the crowd at the the exhibition killing of the Borg Queen. Then it's, it's a bit suspicious. It seemed, again, that some of it was done for speed and haste, and we need people that would have access to this, that, or the other. I found it really weird having Seven slash Annika as the president. Do you really need someone <laughs> to be that high up the chain, the, the, the president? You've already got Gerati with access to the Queen because she's doing the researchy stuff. The little cat made me think of Badgie in Lower Decks. Yeah. Just because of the animation-y sort of thing. You already have Gerati with access to the Queen. You've already got picard in a high rank do you really need to escalate it even further to and we've also got the president (laughs) (laughs) i was like why it just seemed to take it a bit too far for it like i say these stories sometimes it can be interesting to see actors doing something a bit different or you see an alt take i think my problem is that i like some of my star trek to be an optimistic future and i get that that optimistic future maybe seems too far off that's why it's more important yeah that's why i want to see it even more if i want to look at dark dystopian future i'll look out the window please don't turn my star trek into that i need something to think that maybe it all works out (laughs) maybe it gets better 
to keep seeing the dark timeline stuff, you're like, oh. <laughs> and part of the problem with it, I think, is because all of our characters are their true selves, mm. then you don't ever get to see an example of someone familiar being corrupted. All the other characters you meet just belong to that timeline. So it's not as if one of them is evil. This is the point where you could have pulled in like an evil Riker at the side of Picard, maybe, or something turning up at the same time. I don't know. Maybe it would have been too much. But you had Seven's husband who was suspicious. It would have also been useful to have a evil Riker who is then suspicious of Picard acting weird. If you had had something like that also going on, maybe. I do love how naturally Seven took to it and how quickly she figured out what was going on. Meanwhile, Q was just explaining to Picard what was going on. Seven was figuring it out on the fly. Well, I could smell, so I'm not dreaming. And then she very quickly researches who everyone she's met recently is in this universe. So contacts Rios when he's out on the battlefield on his ship and she says some very pointed phrases that will be understood if he is who she thinks he is mm. or who she wants him to be. And then he responds with seven. It's like, right, cool. We're on the same page here. Good to go. I love how she just navigates that timeline really easily. Mm. But like I said, there's no threat to it. And part of the appeal of those previous quote-unquote mirror universe episodes whether they are actually in the mirror universe or whether they're a slanted alternate timeline like yesterday's enterprise for example where the characters are noticeably different but the mirror universe you get plenty of examples of skewed versions of characters that you're aware of so in discovery you got Giorgio, mm. her mirror self and so on and so forth and the original series it was everyone except the ones that beamed through deep space nine usually only one or two of our characters that crossed over so you got to see a flavour of what people are like over there. Whereas with this, you don't. And that's a bit of a problem. So it just feels like it's a bit of an incidental issue that they have to work through. And to be fair, they spend, like you say, about as much time as is comfortable. If you have to do this story, get out of it as quickly as possible. And they did. Yeah, you need to be in there long enough to get the idea of what's going on, but short enough that you're not lurking about for too long in it. If you've got to do it, you've done it the right amount. I'd rather you didn't need to do it but you've done it the right amount, if that's the way to describe it. It wasn't very good, basically. And I think a lot of the COVID restrictions were on display in that one as well. It very much looked like everybody was a bit too far apart. There was a lot of artifice to it. <laughs> it's not an episode I'll ever plan to sit and watch again, because it offers me nothing. Except from the scene between Q and Picard, their conversation is very good. Yeah. Although it's tainted by the fact that it has no bearing on what happens at any point later in the season. <laughs> Yeah, it makes no sense when you compare it with the rest. And just to mop up on the old notes here, there's a couple other elements that I thought were a bit bizarre. We talked about time being wasted and time that could have been diverted to, say, Soong and Corey to make them relevant. You had the FBI arrest episode, <laughs> which really confused me because it had no bearing on anything other than for that episode. It was to get Picard off the board for an episode. It comes from nowhere. And this is something that I didn't notice at the time because... It's an actor who was in an episode of Voyager like 20 years ago. He mm. played Lieutenant Decane, I think his name is, on board the timeship Relativity in the episode of Voyager called Relativity. Basically, they're cleaning up the timeline. That's what that ship does. And the fact that they brought in that actor, I think, was an accident. I don't think whoever cast him and whoever wrote this realised that the actor was the same guy. But what it did was people that recognised him, it sent them down a hole of, ah, oh, the Relativity's here cleaning stuff up. But then... By their own time travel rules, the relativity wouldn't exist because it's part of the true timeline. Unless it does. Unless it's not affected by the timeline. <laughs> Who knows? I would have bought it in that way because none of it connects to anything. So yes, why not have two different timelines at play at once? Why not? But I think that would have actually been more interesting. Picard, we're here to sort this out because you have made a complete mess of everything so we're here to fix this but no he's just some guy he's just some fbi guy who saw vulcan when he was young and now is obsessed with aliens he's as i'm told Mulder, effectively he's the one who believes and he doesn't have a scully who's the skeptic backing him up but arrest picard they verbally joust for a bit and then he gets let go and wells his name is gets fired and then he's not seen again He's not useful at any point. But I think they could have made that character matter because there was points throughout the season and you saw him calling up stuff. He's good at his job because here's pictures of you at the party. Here's a 4K video of you beaming into the street here. So I know there's something up. But you could have had him following them throughout the season and then built towards something 
I totally agree with you. I would have rather if you had seen hints of him through the season where he's getting closer to them or you start getting incidental bits of him being like, oh, I've seen this, or he's turning up at the end of each episode in a scene asking a question about them, like he's in pursuit. The fact that he was in the Voyager episodes, there was an Instagram post before I'd seen the episode because it airs in the US first. There's an Instagram post going, oh, this guy's turned up, so time travel, woo, all that. <laughs> and then, you know, you do the quick Google and you go, oh, he was in a Voyager episode. When you see this guy he turns up, you know, ch- it's got real was the post. And I was like, oh, right, okay. And then I had a little look and I'm like, oh, there's other time travel people involved. Oh, this will be interesting. They've arrested them under the guise so that they can pull them to one side and set them on the right path or take them off the board because they're trying to correct it. I think that would have been a really interesting aspect if you had had two sets of time travellers trying to correct the timeline. One set trying to correct it for the evil timeline, one set trying to correct it for the Starfleet timeline. Would have been an interesting thing. Because one set think, oh yeah, yeah, no, we're totally setting it because this is the way it always was. It always was the dark, horrible timeline. And Picard's like, no, it wasn't always this. Yeah, it could have been evil relativity. Yeah, that might be fun. You could have had evil relativity. You could have had two sets. Because you've got the travellers trying to keep stuff on one path. You've got the Q doing his whatever in the background. (laughs) Inadvertently setting that chain in motion would have potentially been interesting. Q being caught out by, oh, I was setting this off to teach a lesson. And actually what I've done now is I've set two competing factions at war. (laughs) <laughs> some sort of temporal warfare going on i thought that would have been really interesting but yeah like you say it meant absolutely nothing it was to get picard off the board for an episode which i would have forgiven if they hadn't already done the bloody thing with the ice <laughs> capture with rios it was essentially the same thing oh we're taking a character up and we're going yeah they're locked up for an episode because we're moving too quickly through this plot so we're gonna hit pause yet again for a couple of characters for an episode because we're moving too fast you've done this you've done the procedural interviewee nonsense already so move on it just didn't really do much and it was resolved too easily as well that oh i never logged anything i never told anyone about this i just managed to pull you in here into this black (laughs) ops site no paperwork ever being filed all those people that came in and arrested you they don't need to file any paperwork so it'll be seen by no one anyway i just quit my job bye (laughs) really is that it that's all we see we don't get any more help from him for later, there's no Picard going, oh, by the way, there's this other guy trying to stop the Europa mission. Maybe you should help out with that. <laughs> maybe before you hand in your resignation, maybe use your contacts to beef up security around this guy. Was it not that he was fired? I'm sure that was mentioned that he was let go. Was it fired as well? Yeah. Was it? Oh, yeah, he was fired because he had called the raid. That was it. He had called yeah. the raid and it wasn't aliens. It's my mistake. So, yes, so Picard could- couldn't say, by the way, go and arrest soon. That would really help us if you can do that. Yeah, maybe you should dress soon instead. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. It was too tidy. It was too much of the, once again, someone believes the story told sort of thing. It was just too easily resolved for it to take up an episode, to do that, to leave it in the cliffhanger. Inadvertent casting of that actor. If I was more sceptical, I would have said there was rewrites and stuff involved, but... (laughs) I don't think there was. I think it just genuinely was that they hired the same guy by accident. Yeah, he lives in Canada. He's an actor. If it had been, we've hired this guy, he once played an ensign in a random episode who got into trouble with the law or something, you'd be like, oh, that's fine. But the fact he played a character who was a time traveller is kind of like a, oops. Yeah. Maybe not that guy. But anyway, they did it. And like I say, my main problem with it was you've kind of already done part of this story. I'm not really wanting to have another prison break episode. I was glad that they didn't have to break him out or do anything like that. But at the same time, I was like, we've already kind of had this. We're time travellers and we can't tell anyone that we're time travellers but we're stuck but we need to get on with the plot but we need to tell them so we'll let this guy know now as well and then Q turns up for a chat with Guinan because the summoning worked it just took him a while to get there don't get me started on the summoning him from a bottle or something (laughs) like that we had a drink and agreed not to bother each other anymore the Elorians and the Q and this is how we summon them okay we came to a truce and we bottled the essence of that truce I just happen to have a bottle of that. It was entrusted to me, so I have a bottle. Everyone has one. There's only like... No, the Elorians haven't been wiped out by the Borg yet. That doesn't happen until the 23rd century. So there's still plenty of them. 
Yes, we all have a ball. We all have a commemorative plaque and bottle. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. But Q turns up, he has a chat with Guinan. And it is just to set up the whole point of this is for Picard to get over his trauma because everybody that's experiencing trauma is stuck in the past, just as Picard is. And the trap doesn't matter, it's the escape that matters. Okay. Why are we having this conversation just now? Why is it across the whole season only two scenes between Picard and Q? Why bother getting Q back? Because again, with a few tweaks, this season, you could have excised Q from the season entirely. <laughs> okay. You could have got rid of him. I don't think he was necessary at all. The stuff that he ends up facilitating could be facilitated in other ways. Yeah. <laughs> so dumb. And the last note I have of stuff that annoyed me is the overuse of familiar music, particularly the Star Trek fanfare. And I'm referring specifically to the episode where Picard goes to meet young Guinan. It's used three times in the same episode. I think it's always attributed to Picard. Anytime he goes off to do something, it's met with... Da, 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 da. <laughs> Come on, we don't need this every time. And they kept putting first contact music cues as well. And I don't know if you noticed that in the last episode when it, he was at the bar. No, no, I didn't notice We're that. all family. They kept throwing that in. It's such a manipulative way of exploiting nostalgia. Using it once in a while is fine, but three times in the same episode is a bit much. And it's almost like you're trying to crowbar in. Yeah, this is Picard. Don't worry about it. You could play the orchestral remix of every bit of music ever attributed to him and I still won't believe this. So that annoyed me. My element with that, earn it. Earn it with a really good moment, really powerful thing. If you overuse it, you've not earned it. It makes it pointless because it doesn't get played very often. When you get cues like that in discovery it's normally at a moment where it's earned rather than oh we're just throwing it in because star trek here's a moment star trek there you go fanfare done earn it and then we appreciate it. otherwise if it's just overused then it just becomes another musical cue <laughs> and it <laughs> loses its shine and don't do that to it yeah it just really annoyed me so i thought i would get that in there you may have noticed this being more of an audio buff than i am but there was some really bad adr in the last episode for those who don't know what that is additional dialogue recording where they basically <laughs> add lines to scenes to flesh stuff out. There was three egregious points that I have notes of. One was during the drone hacking sequence. There was lots of off-screen dialogue explaining stuff as if it's, oh yeah, this isn't anything, so we need to explain that. So you get lots of shots of the wires with Rafi's voice explaining what she's doing. And there was another two egregious points. When Picard jumps into the smoke transporter with Talon, Rafi says, what is he doing? And it just sounds weird because it doesn't match up with any of the dialogue in the scene, and again, spoken off screen. And then Picard says something about a gift or whatever, after Eleanor is revealed to be not dead. And again, it's clumsy. Clumsily I did. I don't know if you noticed that, but I did. I didn't particularly click on those moments, actually, but I think I was distracted by everything else that was happening at the time. My eyes were too busy rolling to notice who was saying dialogue. It's a shame when you start to notice stuff like that, because I always find that if you're noticing stuff like that, it means that you're not having a good time. Yes, it's lifting you out. It's lifting you out. The amount of times we've talked about it on other shows as well, where it's like, I'll forgive certain shows other things because I was distracted and having a really good time. Normally I would spend my time picking this pieces, but actually because I was enjoying myself, I wasn't paying attention to that or that glossed over me. Whereas with this, the problem is that we've been able to pick up on tons and tons and tons of flaws, which means you're sitting there going, I'm not enjoying this. I'm actually just picking it to pieces as I watch. Please stop inviting Patrick Stewart in the writer's room. <laughs> <laughs> if I've got time to sit there and watch a show and I am picking up on ADR or music cues that I don't like or bits of effect that I don't like, then I'm really not enjoying this because I'm spending my time finding that. If I'm distracted by something else magical that's happening at that same time, then I won't notice it as much. CGI was pretty rough in some of this season as well. The establishing shots of Starfleet HQ and things in the first episode looked really bad. Some of the vineyard shots as well were really crappily rendered, which is weird because I thought it was a real location. Yeah, I thought some of it was a real location as well, but it looks not. In particular, it was one of the final shots of the season, actually, when it's zooming away from the vineyard. Oh, yeah. As Laris and Picard are just looking at each other. As they're looking at each other and then it cuts through the conservatory window thing or the greenhouse window thing. That looked really bad as a piece of CG. The Borg ship in that looked very, very interesting. Everyone in space, you've done all these different space shots and stuff. And then you've done that and you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. And it's really weird because you would imagine the effects budget for this season wasn't extensive outside of the first couple of episodes. And the last episode, I suppose, the Europa 
establishing shot looked really bad as well. The CGI there. Again, it all just looked kind of like PS3 cutscene graphics, which is not a compliment. But the visual effects budget must not have been huge because they were largely filming on location in Los Angeles without any major effects stuff. Yeah, normally the effect shots for that kind of thing are trying to erase bits of background that wouldn't make sense and changing billboards around so that if you're catching a present day billboard, it gets changed to future billboard instead. It's stuff like that that's getting done in those shots rather than anything too intensive it's not creating an entire new world so you can get away with that a bit the odd transporter effect they've been doing them since the 60s making them look convincing so it's easy yeah transporter smoke effects there wasn't really too much of future laser pew pew to put in so it was mainly gunshots and stuff like that when they were doing that there wasn't tons for them to cg up but yeah maybe that's part of the budget i'm trying to think of the previous season as well i don't think the previous season had a lot of effects per se in it either did it I'm trying to think. It had more because they had La Serena flying about space and so on mm. and the Borg Cube and whatever. So there was definitely more visual trickery going on in the last season. But in this one, there was hardly any for a vast chunk of it because it was all location stuff usually. And yeah, you can understand why Patrick Stewart isn't involved as much in the outdoor stuff because he's in his 80s and in a high-risk category at the time. So... That makes sense, but it's nothing to do with cheap-looking CGI. (laughs) Yeah, I can definitely forgive that kind of thing. I don't argue against at all. I'm not expecting him to be running about in every action scene and in every location shot. If the guy wants to lurk about the studio, I think he's earned that right by now. But yeah, I think some of it could have been a bit tidier, like you say, considering the fact that they weren't having to use it excessively in other scenes. It wasn't every scene's a, a CG shot, so you'd think... But maybe that was part of getting the second season commissioned. Maybe it was. Oh, by the way, we found a way of saving money. If you want to give us the second season, we're going to do the following. Or maybe paying Patrick Short as an actor, writer and producer is just too much money. (laughs) (laughs) He's hoovered up all the the cash. (laughs) Do you have any notes that you need to get off your chest before we speculate as to next season? No, I don't think so. I think I've covered it all. The FBI nice capture thing annoyed me, so I've covered that. I think that's probably it. I'm sure I'll end up thinking of something later on, but yeah, let's future gaze. Cool. Okay, so next season, we already know, we discussed it on a news podcast. Next season, we have the return of the entirety of the surviving Next Generation cast, which is all of them. Denise Crosby doesn't seem to be in it, but she might be. After Picard's declaration in 10 Forward, the one on Earth, about... We are all family. It's not going to be seeing any of you guys next season. I'm getting my real family back for the next season. Next Generation cast. And they're going to be on some kind of adventure, probably involving that transwarp conduit. So what do you think is going to happen next season? I've already said I think they're going to go through there and find Khan for some reason and then fight him. (laughs) Who knows? What do I think is going to happen next season? I am not too sure. Obviously, the teaser itself was mainly just teasing the fact that people were going to be on it rather than teasing any content, per se. I did think it was particularly funny that they had released it mid-season two. It's very rare that you get them promoting the third season before the second season's (laughs) finished. There was a first contact day thing, but yes, it does definitely read as, we know you'd hate season two, but don't worry, season three would be this. But it does seem weird. You've got Strange New Worlds to promote or something else that you could put in there, a Lower Decks thing or something. Why would you do tease the second half of your season of Picard, maybe? (laughs) It just seemed like a weird trail to put out. But yeah, having the original cast back, I don't know if it means that they've got the original cast back for the whole season or if it's that they're going to be peppered through. They're all going to be working together. Somehow they're all getting assembled again for reasons as they go because of the way this season finishes presumably that transwarp conduit is going to cause a thing something's going to come through it or someone's going to go through it either or you could have the potential of they send someone like Riker through it and then Picard decides yeah I want to go and save him rescue him he's not been heard from since he's gone through yeah but the, the question around that would be why would they send Riker he's retired Oh yeah, of course, yeah, I suppose. But you know what I mean, sending someone through that he's got a connection to and the rallying cry going out to the original crew going, Starfleet aren't sending anyone, I'm going to go, who's with me? I guess. I don't know, I'm just trying to think of how you justify getting them all together to do a thing. I'm not too sure. The fact that they did the can thing 
there as a tease and like i said earlier on i'm hoping that is just getting dismissed as a little nugget like oh we're going to put something in here that means a thing but actually we're not going to do anything with it can (laughs) yeah i hope so we're putting in something that references canon but we're not actually going to do anything with it it's just a reference there it is can done this is part of project can or this work was part of project can or he was involved in project can and he's still got documents for it something that was turned down before that might get him back on the table you'd think the fact that they've now opened this transwarp conduit would mean that something's going to happen relating to that it seems really weird to build up to a climax on your show and just be oh yeah and by the way that thing's just lurking about in jurati (laughs) border all hanging out there anyway we're off doing something else, something completely different yet again. The fact that they've announced that they're not having a lot of the Picard cast in it, or the season one, season two Picard cast in it, is almost a bit like you said going from season one to season two. Passage of time, stuff happened. Anyway, moving on, something different. Other stuff happened. It'll be like, where's Elnor? Where's this? Where's that? Yeah, they're doing things. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Elnor's at the Academy. So's Rafi. So we won't be seeing them. Where Seven? I don't know. Somewhere. She's off being a Fenris Ranger again. <laughs> Soji, who cares about her? She's off doing whatever. Jurati, she's hanging around outside the Transwarp Conduit, but she's not available right now, so we're just not going to speak to her. Rios, dead. <laughs> dead in the past. Anyway, bye. <laughs> Moving on. Dead, but hundreds of years ago, so he won't be here, and so on. Cynically, it feels like a bit of a cop-out to commission this show where it's this isn't the next generation patrick stewart's really excited about the fact that he's not making the next generation he's doing this new and interesting thing and now season three it's ah yeah it's basically next generation (laughs) it's a send-off for all of these characters rather than just picard fair enough it's good in the sense that the actors that probably aren't seeing a lot for a lot of work will get some work Frakes is not hurting for directing jobs thanks to Star Trek, funnily enough. The rest of them, not so heavily featured in other things. I read an interesting thing because Gates McFadden and Marina Surtees are in this. The quote was something along the lines of, it's great that there are more roles in Hollywood for women over 60, or maybe women over 50, whatever it is. The problem is it's those same roles that those women played when they were in their 20s and 30s. <laughs> It's funny. Unless you're Helen Mirren, you're not getting to work, yeah, basically. It's, it's kind of a sad <laughs> state of affairs, isn't it? You've sort of said you're expecting can and stuff through there. I can't work out what else they would do. Based on this season, I don't know what else they could do. It could be a completely different story with something else happening. It might be absolutely unrelated to what they've done this season, and it would not surprise me if just the whole ball has dropped from this season. Well, the thing is, there's nothing really in the next generation that that crew could consider to be a problem unique to them, a nemesis unique to them, Mm. other than the Borg. But we've done that two seasons in a row now to varying degrees. Are we just going to do it again? (laughs) Another season of the Borg? What else can you do with that? I'm scratching my head over what is going to be a big enough deal to get this crew together, particularly the fact that they are all getting on a bit and there are other people in Starfleet that can handle these sorts of things. And that's another missed opportunity at getting rid of Rios because he's that guy. He is your young captain that you can ride into battle with, so to speak. Picard sitting on the sidelines as the Admiral observing the mission but not commanding the ship. And I would have actually really liked to see Rios and Riker bouncing off each other because there are similarities in those two characters. Not that they're exactly the same, but there are similarities. They both have beards, for example, which is a character trait in Star Trek, (laughs) if you have a beard. That would have been good to see. Obviously, we're not going to see that because they decided to leave Rios in the past, which is a really disappointing ending for him as far as I'm concerned. doesn't matter how you try and slice it. I'm not buying that he needs to be there. So I'm I'm scratching my head over this. It's also a testament to how badly the show has broken my faith in its ability to be any good because they announced something that I should be bouncing off the walls about. I get to see the next generation cast back together one last time. This is something that I've been clamouring for since Nemesis came out. Ever since the end credits of that film rolled, I wanted to see those characters again. I read the follow-up novels or some of them anyway, featuring those characters continuing their missions on the Enterprise because I like that crew, I like that cast, I like seeing what they get up to. So I should be bouncing off the walls, but I'm not excited by it because I feel like this show has ruined Picard in a lot of ways and I'm just worried that they're going to do the same with that cast of characters as well. I know that this show did a really good job with Riker and Troy in one episode. They've got previous and they did okay, even though they have a tragically dead son. 
Can't wait to see what other tragedies have befallen the other members of Picard's old crew. geordie has gone deaf. Worf's lost an arm. It was you that commented to me after you listened to the news podcast, wasn't it, that you wanted to see Worf as a one-armed monk? Yeah, I wanted to combine both your predictions, both you and Andrew's <laughs> predictions. I wanted Worf, the one-armed monk, to appear in this. I'm totally with you. It's something that I said when we rounded up the previous season, it was... Picard goes and visits his friends and finds out why they're depressed. <laughs> I don't want that for all the characters. I do not want every character that crops up in season three to be, oh, here's what a horrible time I've had since we did. The Enterprise was our heyday. Everything went downhill after that. I mean, I suppose <laughs> that was one of the advantages of Guinan. And one of the things that I liked in this season about Guinan, I suppose, is that it wasn't, go and see Guinan. Guinan is also depressed. It's Guinan <laughs> seems to be still living at large and enjoying running a bar. So that's good news. <laughs> I'm running a bar in a location that isn't being almost destroyed every other yeah. week. How great is that? How good is that? And I kind of get your thing of what would be personal to this crew and what would facilitate this specific group of people having to reform and do a thing. And that's why I said it's got to be almost one of them needs rescued, help, assistance, whatever, and that would band the rest of them together. Because yeah. otherwise, like you say, there is an entire fleet out there. We've said it during the Discovery one as well. It's Starfleet, not Star One ship. There's other people that can do things. Also, it's a shame Data's dead, so we'll just get that soon guy, probably from season one. <laughs> oh, He'll no. be a stand-in. Yeah, he'll be there. I will have some holographic representation. I don't know. They're reuniting the rest of the crew, so maybe they will get that soon. Guy, but oh, yeah. But I don't want them to do that. One thread that has never been finished, as far as I'm concerned, is Lore, Data's brother. Okay, yeah. That could be a reason for them to get back together, I guess. I will say I'm excited to see Worf again. Worf is my favourite character in all of Star Trek, so I'm excited to see that. And Michael Dorn has confirmed that they will be putting the old makeup on, so he's not going to be a Discovery Klingon all of a sudden. Has there been any word of uh, the most important man in Starfleet history, Miles O'Brien? No. Deep Space Nine is not getting any love. <laughs> the most love it got was in this season, other than Lower Decks. General Sisko was mentioned in the second episode. There was. The I got very timeline. excited at that mention. I thought, is General Sisko going to appear at this ceremony? No, no, no. No, of course not. <laughs> it would have to be Jake Sisko. He's the only one that you would coax out of the house. General Jake Sisko. Not the Sisko you were expecting. You're welcome. <laughs> You won't get Avery Brooks out of the tree he lives in or whatever he does. <laughs> He's a weird, crazy hermit now, I think. Yeah, it would have to be Jake Sisko. And there was also mention of Galdukat, which we already mentioned. General Martok was also mentioned. The Grand Nagus. So all the love Deep Space Nine has gotten since the franchise came back is in an alternate, awful timeline. Brilliant. Other than in Lower Decks, where they put together Deep Space Nine model kits that have and Esri and the Jazia and stuff like that. <laughs> Quarks is a franchise as well. There's bars named Quarks. I think Quarks name checked in the first season of Picard as well in the Casino Planet episode. Oh, he might be. I think his name is on a bar, so he franchises out. But yes, it gets no love, does Deep Space Nine. So Miles O'Brien, he could turn up because he does belong to both, but I doubt it. Boo. We're going to see Wesley again, surely. Yeah, could do. I think they'll do something with that. No idea what this will be about, but. I'm worried that they're just going to make a mess of those characters in the way that they've tainted Picard. Yeah, the thing is, they can't change what you've already seen. The problem is they can taint your memory of it or change context around what you've seen that then can taint it. That's the problem. I always say to people, they've never removed what you've already seen. It's not been deleted. The tapes have not been erased. It's just that they can change your view of it or how that character acted in that moment knowing context that you now know it's that sort of element that they can tweak yeah unless i just write this off in my head as non-canon some kind of fever dream some kind of q alternate reality situation i genuinely thought at one point that was how it could resolve because i was like <laughs> you've not got much longer left of a season to wrap this up <laughs> although the picard android is canon definitely canon because of discovery name checking it mm-hmm Never mind. Okay, so next season, who knows? Am I excited about seeing the crew getting back together? Kind of. I'm excited to see those actors in those roles again, but I am not excited to see what this show will do to them. It's like Dad's Army, isn't it? <laughs> Best way to describe it, I suppose. That's a very British reference for our American and beyond listeners. Hmm. Okay, so we shall wrap up, unless you had any other thoughts on season three or anything before. No. So summarise your thoughts on season two then. Pretty much what I said at the beginning. I think the season went on for too long. I think it had 
elements in it that were good it had some good acted moments it had some good scripted moments however there was lots of stuff that just didn't make sense if you analyze it in any fashion it was just disappointing to see characters that you love getting used in that way it's a disappointing end to a character that people really really like yeah i was really disappointed in this season kind of I would say it more fulfilled my expectations rather than disappointed me, I suppose, because I think I was very critical of it before it began. And then when the trailers came out, the trailers were just showing me things I didn't want to see. And then the season played out more or less as I expected. Like I said, there was individual moments and elements that I really enjoyed. I would come out of a scene thinking, I like that. I thought that was an interesting conversation or whatever. And then when you find out how worthless that whole sequence and scene is, taints it a bit i've used the word taint a lot in this Mm. podcast but it does definitely taint it it started making me feel like they were wasting my time just by filling tight and that's a lot of what they were doing the well stuff that we talked about it's just to kill time for an episode despite the fact we spend a whole bloody episode on it soon kills time corey kills time etc 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 so there was just a lot of wheel spinning and a lot of meandering when there wasn't very much story to tell I don't think. That was the problem. They were stretching it out. We've got 10 episodes here. Let's stretch this out for 10 episodes. Set most of it in the present day for us, or a couple of years in the future. Let's set it in the same year as a notable Deep Space Nine episode. One that got a lot of play during the pandemic, actually. It was brought up a lot because of the way homeless people were being treated and the gap that was widening in society ended up getting a reappraisal as being a very prescient episode. So this was almost spot on in terms of the high level stuff. So the fact that they chose that year and then didn't really play with that was a bit of a confusing one. Disappointment of a season for some people. For me, it more met expectations rather than didn't, but just not keen for season three. I'm ready for the show to finish and be done with it and never have to watch anything to do with it ever again. (laughs) I say anything to do with it ever again. I'll still be watching plenty of Star Trek. But I'm I'm glad there'll be no more Picard after this. Yeah. My thing is, is that I'm not hopeful for the next season, but I really hope that it is good. I'm not expecting it to be excellent, but genuinely, it's not that I sit there and want a show to fail. I want them to do really, really well by those characters and hopefully do it correctly. Don't want to sit for 10 hours at a minimum watching this show and not enjoying it. Don't want to be doing that. I don't hate watch, except The Flash. That's the only exception. And even then, I don't like the show, but I don't want to dislike the show. It's not something that I watch because I hate it. It's something I watch because I remember when I used to like it. Anyway, this show, I'm not expecting it to be good, but I'm really hoping it will be because I'm going to be watching each episode twice. I'm going to be writing about every episode and then I'm going to be podcasting about it. Probably knocking on a hundred hours of content around that season in terms of my approach to it. So I want those hundred hours to be well spent. If that's how long it'll take me. Roughly, probably. That's depressing to even think about. But at least I get to see Worf one last time, presumably. Or maybe he'll get his Captain Worf spin-off that he keeps banging on about. That'd be great. I'd love that. Unless it's the depressing adventures of Captain Worf. Then I don't want that. Or he goes back in time and creates the Klingon Empire or something. Worf. Warrior Monk. Yeah, Worf. Warrior Monk. i definitely watch that. (laughs) Anyway, we did it. That was our Season 2 of Picard discussion. I'd like to thank Captain Meat Shield and Dark Materia for the supplied music. If you enjoyed what you heard, then please do hit subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcasts, wherever you're listening to it right now, there's probably a subscribe button. Mash it and listen to more of us complaining about Star Trek because there'll be plenty of it. Two white guys complaining about Star Trek. Where else on the internet will you find that? The answer is pretty much everywhere but you have chosen this one so thanks for that and if you're on apple Podcasts or spotify i think handle it now or some apps allow in app ratings please do give us a rating but what number would we like that rating to be five stars i was hoping that you weren't going to say number one to (laughs) be on brand because (laughs) that was is not what we want but yes five stars plus a comment if you don't mind please do that if you want to talk to us about star trek picard Star Trek in general, anything really, hit us up on Facebook or Twitter under Neil Before Blog or leave a comment on neilbeforeblog.co.uk. And as always, we hope you'll join us next time on Neil Before Pod Engage. <laughs>